boy, I bet based on these box office results, I bet they wish there was Warner Brothers wishes there was a flash mob. It's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, Great everybody. Timely joke. <laughs> Thank we're you. Up, hello. Up. Okay. And hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to an episode of the Min Mac Show, a place about games, friends, and getting better. My name is Ben Hanson, and I want to thank you for being here. We're joined by Kyle Hilliard, who has lost his darn mind. Yes, that's good. But thank you. I well, think. Welcome to the Wacky Up, folks. We got Jacob Keller here. It's the morning. And we're joined by Leo Vader. Ooga booga. This is the special morning episode of the podcast. If you're not listening in the morning, uh, you got to pause it, wait for the next early morning to roll around, then hit play and say, now I feel in sync with these gamers. Uh, <laughs> on this episode of the podcast, we're getting a little funky. We've done something close to this before, but this episode is going to be, be, uh, be about our uh, gaming confessions. Something that we're reluctant to admit in any sort of public forum about our thoughts about games, maybe... Something that's on our pile of shame in the backlog, perhaps an opinion that is too deep and dark to share online. We're going to share it online on this very episode. And then we're going to get to the good stuff. We're talking about Stellar Blade with Jacob Geller. He's going to go into all sorts of graphic detail about that game. Uh, <laughs> then we're talking Pepper Grinder, uh, Bramble the Mountain King. Good Lord. And then back half of the show, we have some great questions submitted over there on Patreon from the Patreon community. Gaming confessions. I know this is a weird thing out of the blue, and it's kind of the fun thing of like, hey, do you guys are you guys ever doing this concept episode? Yep. And now I don't know what anybody else has chosen. <laughs> I don't know the flavor of anybody else's confessions. Jacob, was it easy for you to come up with uh, hot confessions here? No, Ooh. it was. I, I a lot of them are. I've got a couple that are pretty recent, and a lot are like very old. You know, kind of like going back to like high school even even Ooh. middle school of just kind of like mm. embarrassing things because i feel like i don't know i i just feel like that's a more embarrassing time of your life like you know in i was at, actually at really current cool age. and well liked yeah i don't know what you're oh, talking about yeah, we were really sweet <laughs> our facial hair was awesome yeah yeah um, yeah but i i think i got I got some good ones. I've got some that I'll be uh, embarrassed to say. Okay, great. Air. And that's why we're going to start with Leo Vader. Give us your first <laughs> gaming confession, baby. And this is a safe space? You, no. mean, you mean offline? Yeah. Okay, yeah. We're going to turn it's the comments off us? for this one episode. Yeah, you're going gonna to ble bleep these in post, right? <laughs> That'd be such a wild <laughs> <laughs> move. Yeah. Um, I've kind of talked a big game over the past couple few years about being good about not spending money in game. Oh, oh in game. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, I like where this is going. Yeah. Not being tempted for microtransactions and stuff. Cause it's right. like, you can just resist the urge and unlock stuff for free. And it's a totally good way to spend your time. You don't like feel that have to have to put that money in, but I'm almost $200 deep in the finals already. <laughs> the finals 200 wow. bones yeah so and it's I, like the things you're buying are like changing the gameplay and like making yeah it's it like they're making you better <laughs> <laughs> they're giving me more gameplay which is time spent making outfits <laughs> which i will boot that game up in the morning and just make outfits and quit it and not even play but oh, wow. is it fun I love it so much. It makes me think like, well, maybe just no other cosmetics have been good because I keep seeing awesome Ooh. stuff in this one. They added uh, skins for a few different guns that are sticks, just like you're playing pretend with a stick and the reload animation is you like knock the front half of the stick down and pour pebbles into it. Ooh, okay. And how much is I that going to cost I see so many things me? and I'm like, well, I have to buy this and build an outfit around it. So the animations like are, are changing? Like reload animations are changing? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty slick. And it's hard to resist. Is the reason you were talking a big game is because you know you're prone to this type of microtransaction nonsense and then you like were pretty good for six months and that's why you were interrupting the intro of every episode of the podcast for the last <laughs> uh, six months to brag about how good you were at not spending money on this crap? Yeah, I was excited to have change. <laughs> <laughs> But but do we? Now, the the, the uh, stick, stick animation, you also, the inspect animation is you like whittle it. You take on a knife and you scrape off the top of it. There's no doubt oh, that goodness. sounds great. There's no doubt that sounds great. I mean, I would $20. Yeah, no, that doesn't sound great anymore. I take it all back. Whoa, In fact, whoa, that's bad. Jesus. That is a lot. That's like the uh, <sighs> Overwatch 2 having Cowboy Bebop skins that are like more expensive than buying the complete cowboy bebop <laughs> <set. laughs> But uh, hang on. How's the, how's the player base of the finals? 
Um, not as good as it was at the start, but it's solid. I find okay. matches in five seconds every time, but people still complain about it being being a dead I, game. My, I guess my my greater question is like. Is is this game gonna disappear? And then you've spent two hundred dollars on something that like can't even match make anymore. <laughs> it's very, very possible. There's no doubt about that. At least it's a free to play game. Uh, moving on to the next. No, it's a twenty dollar game apparently. But that's that's <laughs> stick price. Screenshots of my outfits that'll last a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> no shame here, man. This is a safe place for confessions. I mean, you'll be mocked endlessly by us and the comments, which are. Uh, going to be out of control. Yeah, but really turn still, up the heat this episode. <laughs> it's really guys. a situation. Hey, speaking of uh, turn up the heat, Kyle Hilliard, hit us, baby. One more time. Uh, um, I had one. I mean, this is a little, this is different, or maybe it's not. I have this specific memory of an E3 and the game Tekken Revolution had come out, which was the free-to-play Tekken oh, game. Oh, wow, Yeah. And I, I don't really, I'm not a big fighting game fan. I'm even less of a Tekken fan. I've, I've never really played more than a couple minutes of Tekken. And I had a chance to interview Katsuhiro Harada and mm -hmm. with his, and his translator, Michael Murray, who's like also a designer on the game. They're always together. You've probably seen them together. I've never seen and them in separate rooms. Tekken yeah. Revolution had released while we were at E3. The free to play Tekken had launched. And I was so like struggling for questions and trying to be polite that I was like, oh, you, you guys shouldn't have released it while you're at E3 because now I can't play it. <laughs> I want to go home and play it. And the second I said it, I was I for some reason, I just felt terrible. I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to play this game. I don't want to play a free to play Tekken. I just lied directly <laughs> to their face. And, and I and I even went, and I felt so like weirdly bad about it that I went home and downloaded it. <laughs> and like and I booted it up and I was like I don't I don't want to play this I don't want to play a free to play Tekken game and you've kept this rod going for years like you kept taking like selfies of you like <laughs> with fake uh, trophy data sending it to him like yeah Harada yeah, check it out put me Harada, on your YouTube channel like, are you I'm, I'm really trying to figure out this Waffle House thing I don't need you to remind <laughs> me about Tekken Revolution but it just it was just one of those moments yeah, I where it. I was just trying to be polite and I just no. I just felt like I had just bold faced lied to these two men who traveled across the world to come yeah. to the United States and talk to journalists. I got a similar one, Kyle. This is a bonus one for me. Oh, good. But it, it reminded me of it where I remember we were on a cover story trip for Game Informer. We were out at some stupid fancy restaurant. We were in Montreal and the developers, you know, it was casual, loose, whatever. And they're like, yeah, so what do you think people are going to think about like the announcement of our game? And I was like, yeah, I think they're going to be I think they're going to be excited. I think there's enough stuff to like really have it pop. I think it's going to have a splash online. And as I was talking, keep in mind, I went on like so many cover stories back to back. I went on like 80 total cover story trips. As I was talking to them, my brain was reeling. Even after a day of demos, I was like, what game was this again? Because I genuinely <laughs> could not remember what game these developers were working on. And I felt just numb. Uh, it was a Thief, it turns out. Um, <laughs> and oh. it, it turns out maybe it didn't have the biggest splash when it came out. I, I swear to God, if you ask people, did a Thief game come out in 2014? I'd argue most people on the sidewalk wouldn't even know. That's how little of a splash of it. <laughs> that was a uh, that Thief 2014 game was the answer of the guess the game for like Wordle. Uh, oh, really? Game thing the other day, and I actually got it, and I was like, "What? What knowledge have I not retained because I can identify <laughs> a screenshot of Thief 2014?" But do you remember the classic tagline for Thief 2014? Uh, sure don't. What? Gimme, gimme. <laughs> Very close. It's <laughs> it's it's literally <laughs> on the on the back of the box. It says, "What's yours is mine." Like, what? That's <laughs> you're gonna get me to buy the game based on that? Uh, uh, all right, Jacob, you got one. Uh, okay, yeah. Here's a. This is a recent one. Um, in the game Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, uh -oh. uh, you might know uh, you you it, build up character affinities. With now we should your, say very very light spoilers very based on based spoilers, on the original yeah. Final Fantasy VII as well. If you know basic concepts, but just you can jump ahead if you're super wary of stuff. Um, yeah, so you build up you build up character affinities, you know, you're kind of building a friendship meter with everyone. Uh, there is kind of like a big date uh, in the game, and the person that you go on the date with is based on who you have the highest affinity with. And I am, have been, uh, a big Tifa stan. Okay, buddy. And I really, I really wanted a date with Tifa, and the character 
like the affinity bars are very uh poor where they don't actually show you like the number they just show you like a v- ambiguous smiley face and kind of everyone <laughs> will have the same one and so I, I had no way of knowing and so i did not only did i not do side quests with anyone other than tifa because i wanted to <laughs> ensure that i did i did like the whole chocobo racing side quest which i hated in order to get this date with tifa and all of that is like not that embarrassing yeah. but like my i was sitting next to my real life girlfriend while i was doing all this and and she was kind of talking to me about it and i was getting like real life snotty to her <laughs> being like, well they're probably not even gonna give me fucking tifa because the game is just so like so like who can i don't i guess i don't even care anymore and it was like being, i was like talking to her in a way that i'm very embarrassed by Oof. because i was like so committed to getting a date with tifa <laughs> uh and this is a we should know that jacob's gonna be talking about stellar blade later on this episode yeah, that's right. uh, <laughs> so did you get the date with tifa I did. Okay. Yeah. Was it cool oh, and I'm good? Happy for you. Yeah, it was definitely worth it. I really felt good about talking to my girlfriend no, that when like, I saw that date with Tifa. That sucks, but generally, was the date good? But yeah. Okay. Good. I watched, I watched all of them. Weirdly, my favorite date. I, I, I won't say who my favorite date's with, but it like... Oh. The the well, I don't know. Would it you, be a spoiler? You can, I think it's okay. Yeah, I think I think the most interesting date is with Yuffie, uh, which oh. I would never play the game in order to get a date with Yuffie. But like <laughs> right. watching them Fucker all back to back, possible. I yeah. love that. I love it. Uh, I, I my first confession. I'll tie it in thematically with yours, Jacob. <clears throat> Art is subjective. Some people say this is a one star podcast on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> Other people go as high as three. Um, so I'm keeping that all in mind, but. Here's a hot take. I know we all spo- are supposed to think it's like this legendary, cool relic from the past, and it all looks great. I don't like Yoshitaka Amano's Final Fantasy art. I don't think it looks cool. Oh, wow. Uh, the okay. logos, I think, look cool. But when it's like, hey, here's Amano's concept art for Zidane from Final Fantasy IX, I think some of that art looks kind of dumb. Now, <laughs> if I may... It, it is, I respect the cool novelty of having this concept artist, you know, working for decades on this stuff. Leo, you're squinting at Amano's art right now. I'm this like, article is it, called yeah. The Breathtaking Final Fantasy Art of Yoshitaka Amano. Yeah. Yeah. How could you think it's bad if there's an article called that? Yeah. Uh, it, it's breathtaking in that I want to take my breath and hold it in my body until I pass out and don't have to keep looking at this. Is, is the nine art specifically like he's like mid stride? Is that kind of, it could be, I think just, it's all kind yeah, of okay. funky and weird. And I, I don't, maybe I need to brush up on uh, Japanese art history. Cause I'm a little have bit rusty. Have you seen what Zidane looks like in game? Yeah, because this art is actually 10 times <laughs> better than that. So you'd want a final fantasy nine version where it's just actually a mono's art or any final fantasy game where it's just a mono's yeah, art. Of course. I mean, I this would be into that so for the novelty of it. Really? Okay. All right. And it will say, I would say the quality varies wildly. Okay. Uh, I think it's an interesting novelty, but it's never really structurally as important than that. And I will say I have extra juice here because when I was in uh, Tokyo for the Final Fantasy 15 cover story trip for Game Informer, I got to go to Amano's art studio and it was like the coolest space I've ever been in in my life. Just like clean and completely <laughs> silent and like beautiful assistant came over and gave me the best coffee I've ever had in my life. And I got to meet Amano. He's like the most peaceful guy and he has a giant, you know, like the Final Fantasy cat, which has like the tendrils tentacles coming out the back of its head he had a huge sculpture of that in the lobby it was like the most amazing space i've ever been in i just think the art you know not for me not for me but hey <laughs> I, just, I like the idea of you walking around this you know quote-unquote gallery like as as a as a someone who like doesn't know that the artist is actually there yeah. and you're just sort of like complaining about it yeah. to whoever you're with <laughs> yeah, it's all right. i could have done I that <laughs> <laughs> i would never go that far uh okay leo hit us with another one man Redeem Here's us, a simple, please. simple true confession. I have not held my Nintendo Switch in my hands a single time since I got my Steam Deck five months ago. It's, Ooh, it's okay, I literally set my Steam Deck on top of it in the basket next to my bed. <laughs> I love that. I love the range of these confessions. Yeah, I hear you. Um, what do you think it would feel like when you go back to the Switch? Small. Small. Light. Light. I know you you'd like you throw it point. into the air by accident is what would happen <laughs> <It's> <laughs> when you lifted it up <laughs> or crush it into dust. 
Do you think- just collapses like an accordion in your hand. <laughs> I, I had the same realization the other day, which is I haven't touched it since Tears of the Kingdom. That's the last mm. that's the last Switch game that I played. And like since then, I you know, my girlfriend has played something on it, but I haven't touched it. Uh, you know, you miss a lot of things. It's really satisfying on the Steam Deck to like, do you also, also, also always rub the little track pads for like the weird haptics like bump? I, I do. And I, and I think I would, there's no world where I could ever play a game using this. No, every time I, no. <laughs> it's just so fun to play with though. That's my little weird yeah. fidget space. Uh, you're, you're, you're cool, Leo. Don't worry about it, man. You're still cool. Sorry, Nintendo. <laughs> My gaming hey, confession a, is that I'm in playing F Zero Maximum Velocity, and y'all are missing out. Nah, that's the GBA uh, cool launch confession. game. <laughs> God damn, this it, guy's sure. It really it made all. me realize how many games I rebought on Switch to have them on the go, and then going through my Steam library, it's like, oh yeah, I can if I want to play those. Now I play them on this, and they run better. Yeah, true. Uh, Kyle, you got one? Yeah, I'll stick with the Final Fantasy theme for a oh, little while no. here. Do we have to, you guys? <laughs> well, I gotta get out of the way. People can leave okay, comments so on I, this. I have I have played a lot of Final Fantasy games, right? I haven't beaten a lot, and so if I think in terms of the Final Fantasy games I have played to completion and seen credits to, I think my favorite is Final Fantasy 15. Mm. And how many like, have you seen credits? What, what's to, that list? Yeah, yeah. It's, how, it's how, not how? long. Like I've played like <laughs> half of a lot of games, but it's 15. The two seven remakes. And sixteen. Oh, okay. Oh, doesn't that make fifteen <laughs> by default the best one you've played since you wanted to finish I it? Get, the I guess I I thought I thought it would because like I have played like three quarters of of like ten and like uh, thirteen and like the original seven I played a fair bit of. I've played a, a like a bunch of hours of nine. I've probably gotten almost to the end of six. Like I've yeah. played a lot of Final Fantasy, but like but the best is fifteen. Okay, 15 is like probably my favorite because it gives me the like, if I think like the ending truly was making me like tear up, like mm. the ending of that game is really strong. And like, I really felt something, uh, something that I felt like nothing at the end of either of the seven remakes or 16. I was just like, okay, I just like shrugged my shoulders where 15, I was like wiping a tear from my eye and being like, ah, I really went on a, an adventure there. I get Final Fantasy now. Like it is the game that made me get Final Fantasy. And so often, like even on your guys' deepest dive, yeah, it, you guys were talking about your history with Final Fantasy in recent games. I think the 16 uh, discussion that you had recently, you guys were just like, right. yeah, who can have well, they like a lot more than I. Oh, 15. Yeah, like 15 is just the one that's like, well, no one likes 15. No, that's. I think Ronnie and Grant like 15. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think. Most I, sorry, I thought that would be more impactful. I thought you guys would be like, no one likes 15. No, What's wrong with you? Right. No, that's a good one. I like that. Yeah, it's like I do think. I watched the movie. <laughs> uh, dude, that's the best Final Fantasy movie. Kingsglaive, like I, yeah. I really do like that 15 movie a lot. Um, I should rewatch that. Um <laughs> and shatter my I, opinion. I almost it. it was on it was on they had a package. I, I use Voodoo to watch a lot of movies, and they had Kingsglaive and Advent Children in a pack. And I was like, should I buy those? Like, would it be nice to have access to those? Yes. At any time? Yes. <laughs> like, well, give me spirits within, and then it's an instant buy. <laughs> yeah, I have I have some nostalgia for spirits within. I remember going to see that in theaters. I just saw uh, this isn't the community to get a load of this, but I saw somebody share in that channel uh Conan reviewing spirits within on his old show. <laughs> but he just like it's not like uh, you know, uh what is this gaming show called? Oh, uh, clueless gamer. Clu- like yeah, it's not like a clueless gamer, gamer style gamer review. Gamer, yeah, you know. it's just him making a stupid joke about them running out of money and then turning into puppets. It's it's a fine bit. Um, okay, Jacob. Not cool. Not, not cool, cool, man. Conan. Leave Final uh, Fantasy okay. alone. <laughs> on on the theme of not beating games, um, I have never beat a Mario game prior to Mario sixty four. Uh, so I haven't I haven't beat Super Mario World or Mario Bros or Mario Bros uh, 3. Uh, I I've, <laughs> I think I've... And I, and I was thinking, it was like, I don't think I've ever completed more than the first two levels of Super Mario Bros. That's interesting. Just yeah. ever. I, like, I've never even got to, like, a Bowser fight in that game. I just kind of <laughs> do it, and it's like, I'm not good at it, and I, you know, fall down a hole immediately, and I'm just like, nope, I, I'll play a new one that feels good. What about Yoshi's Island? No? Nope. Ooh, now we're talking. Uh, Nathaniel Day wrote in with that exact same thing, that they haven't beat anything before Mario 64. I was in your camp a while ago, Jacob, and then I had, like, 
it was just a summer where I played Mario 3 and Mario World back to back. And let me tell you, after that, changed my tune, buddy. Um, here's This is also actually related to the your art thing. I think Super Mario Bros. 3 has like a really bad art style. Whoa! I do not Whoa! like the way that game Whoa! looks at all. <laughs> Jacob Geller, I swear to God, my next confession is I think in the world of Mario, <laughs> the art of Super Mario World I don't like it, but I love three as a comparison oh, point. Right. <laughs> you don't like the art of three. It's so funky and weird and like that weird 8-bit theater look to it all. I Heck love yeah. I the mean, art I of like three. I like the idea. I think it's more like the whole, the layout of the screen, like the stupidly huge UI with like the speed meter at the bottom. <laughs> I'm always like, it feels like, you know, today when people put like, oh, Ubisoft UI on like a From Software game where it has like side quests and whatever. It yeah. just feels like people are putting things on the screen for no reason or it's like, well, I don't need to see all this information. <laughs> you don't care about your score? Nope. I've also, <laughs> confession, I've never cared about score. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's fair. Yeah, my, my next one, and I wasn't going to do all these art ones back to back, but I, I feel a similar way, and it's not about the UI necessarily, but you know, I, I have zero nostalgia for it, and when I see the art of Super Mario World, I'm just like, I, this is like a default video game in so many people's minds, and it just looks like a bulbous nothing. Like, I think Mario <laughs> looks weird. I think all the characters look weird in Super Mario World, and I think it was just like coming to it late. I don't know. But that said, Yoshi's Island, one of my favorite games of all time, and the art is incredible. And Mario 3, I love the art and color scheme of Mario 3 so much, but Mario World, it just, I don't know. It's not, it's not fitting with me. I think that's fair. Thank you. I, oh I like, I, I am... I was late to the Super Nintendo, like I was a Donkey Kong Country kid, like that was the game that got me into Super Nintendo, and Yoshi's Island I love, and I feel like you you put Yoshi's Island in front of children today, and even they will be like, this looks cool, like I love the way this looks, so to go back, because they're very, they're very picky, man. I see um, about old graphics, but like, um, yeah, to go back to world feels like, like a step back for me yeah, as well. I think that's kind of my experience as well, yeah. Okay, Leo, leave Mario and Final Fantasy alone for the love of Christ. The comments can't take anymore. Oh, if, do you want me to take all the heat off you for the Mario stuff? Yeah, please. Because I really don't think those old Marios even play well. I think you slide around too much. <laughs> I think they feel bad. <laughs> whoa. So Leo, about that. whoa. Um, here's a true confession. I think that every time I turned a game off after 10 minutes and never picked it up again, I was right. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Do you really think that's usually enough time to know whether you're gonna like a game or not, whether it's for you? <sighs> Have you? But yeah, yeah that uh, that like it doesn't get good till forty hours. Argument is like in general is so tough. Like it's like it's like that's that's then you then it's it's not good, you know. But I have <laughs> had I have had games where I've muscled through, and then I do have a really thrilling experience but it's like is it worth that muscling through i i don't know if that it is i don't know and i also might know myself as being too petty where if i had 10 hours of a bad time even if it starts to get good it's like screw you <laughs> right <laughs> precious hours <laughs> but i like you starting like you know the god of war 2018 and god of war ragnarok and stuff and give it a 10 minutes and be like yeah 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 absolutely not for me like, <laughs> there's you know what i thought of yeah. was god of war ragnarok i kept giving more time right. i gave like 10 hours because i was like i really want to give this a fair shot and not just turn and, it away and that's one of the ones where i was like i could have stopped this at 10 minutes and known exactly how much i liked it <laughs> and then you were extra bitter towards it i feel like because of that okay Probably. okay interesting a little this is like a pile of shame one which i didn't know how many of these we were going to do yeah like you know but i have never played I don't think I've played a single second ever of Warcraft, Starcraft, or World of Warcraft. Oh, that's good, man. I have that's never same boat. installed them, touched them. I like the World of Warcraft is the big one for me because it feels like this yeah. just monument of like a, a genre of video games, and it's so defining for so many people. And people play it for thousands of hours and leave it behind and come back to it you know, a thousand hours again, like five years later, it's like, I've never, 
I don't know anything about that universe or and Here's, I don't, yeah. Well, I don't just watch to. the movie. You get the idea. Um, I watched the trailer for the World of Warcraft movie. That's like the extent of my Warcraft knowledge. I think you get it more than most people. Then it, it, you know, World of Warcraft, obviously gargantuan. You should have some experience with that. But at the same time, that's that's a tall order because like what's what's the finish line? Wait, Leo, ten minutes in World of Warcraft. That's a wet fart of an experience. But that's just <laughs> logging in, probably. I, yeah, yeah I, I've I've played probably ten to twenty hours of World of Warcraft over my adult life of various attempts to get into it because I have so many friends who have gotten into it in a way unlike any other game I've ever seen in my life. They just literally have devoted their whole lives at the altar of this game. So there must be something to it. And I don't think in those early hours I've gotten to any of the things they like about it. Yeah. Besides Um, a general like level of comfort from doing the quests and going through it, there's like nostalgia there. That's a factor for them. And just like, this is a cozy game versus to me, it's like, this is a ugly game that doesn't feel good. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Kyle, I don't mean to one up your confession, but I'm just looking at the uh, list of Blizzard games. The only Blizzard game I have ever played is Overwatch. Whoa! Like, <laughs> no, I have not. I've never. I've never touched a Diablo. Really? I never did Hearthstone, Heroes of the Storm. Uh, I, it literally is yeah. just Overwatch one, and that's it. Yeah, you- I. Uh, Hearthstone. I was like, there, there must be something special here, and like, I was like, I don't get this. <laughs> and immediately uninstalled that. And then I D- Diablo is like I I truly tried with four. I played like three or four hours of Diablo four. Mm-hmm. I, I I thought I was like, oh, I, maybe this will be a good like working out game. Like I'm on my my stationary bike. I'll play Diablo and get a bunch of gear. And I was like, I don't know if that made it worse or something, but I was like, I hate this. Like I really <laughs> Diablo is just never going to click for me. And I don't and I need to be OK with that. Wow, that's that's fascinating. I still think, Kyle. Um, StarCraft II Wings of Liberty's campaign it it seems impossible to me that you wouldn't enjoy that it is yeah. it is the Mario Galaxy of RTS games like every <laughs> mission is completely different super creative there's like a cool base or like a station you're building up and talking to people like Mass Effect in between like I, I think that game is so awesome and I, it's on the yeah. list of potential right. deepest dives I think it'd be fascinating to have somebody who's never touched Starcraft jump into that because we're RTS in general like yeah. I, that genre is just a big blind spot for me like I remember Halo Wars coming out and being like maybe this will be the one that I'll try and see if this genre does anything for me and yeah. like I was playing on a, a 360 with a controller and I was like where that was the 360 game right wasn't yep. it yep Okay, and that was, and I was like, I, just, I don't think this is for me. Wow, <laughs> just, the closest I think I've gotten is Brutal Legend, and that's like the part of that <laughs> game I hate the most. Is like I, <laughs> I like the story, I like driving around the world. Right, uh, it's like, and then I have to do this like RTS stuff to get back to the cutscenes, and I want to see what happens. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know? nobody's perfect. Uh, I actually have an <laughs> RTS related one for you, Kyle. Just to transition okay. and skip Jacob for for once. Um, despite loving Age of Empires, uh, and screaming about it a lot on this very podcast the for most people the number one age of empires game loves about the show right (laughs) yeah 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 uh the number one game for a lot of folks is age of empires 2 never gotten into it (laughs) that's like the (laughs) go-to age of empires game and i didn't have a computer that could run it when it came out and so i went back to it then after the fact and i was like "Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, i get it it seems like a slightly better version of one but i've never really felt love in my heart for age of empires 2 That said, the soundtrack I did listen to a lot when it came out, and the soundtrack I love. And so that ropes me in a little bit, but I missed the boat, and I just have never gotten into the groove of what everybody hails as the greatest Age of Empires game. So total fake-ass fan here for just loving one (laughs) mythology and four, apparently. And three is fine. All right, Jacob, what do you got? All right, uh, I've got a confession. Um, uh, The the most... I've ever been into a multiplayer game in my life was probably the original Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, uh, which isn't the confession. Um, and you might remember in that game, uh, there was a, a a 25 kill streak where you could get a nuke and you would just like end the game. You could yeah. win. Um, and I wanted that so bad just just to get <laughs> one nuke was like my goal playing it. Um, and I, I was not very good um at the game and so i i tried for a long time to get it through just like pure skill and i couldn't and so i was going on forums and essentially finding like what are the most toxic ways for me to play (laughs) to get this where there are like it was like if you went on 
you know, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, like, game facts pages, it would be everyone was screaming about this one class that you could do where you could basically give yourself infinite grenade launcher ammo, and it was, like, really annoying, and everyone hated those players, and I was like, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. And so for weeks, I would play, like like my focus tested most annoying way to play the game and like ruin it for everyone else and i still never got a nuke but i just <laughs> think about like oh, going going in and like playing the game in purposefully the most toxic way possible to <laughs> get this goal that i'd never achieved uh, was, was part of that like game fact suggestion is just like be be a jerk on the mic to just really yeah <laughs> I'm so oh. sorry you never got a nuke. I like feel bad. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think I'd be sense. a better person if I got one. No, I don't think that's true. It's a, a new show plus. Let Jacob finally gets a nuke. Mm. You wouldn't have regretted your behavior at all. You would have been. There like, was there yeah. was a thing. This isn't this isn't a confession, but like I was playing uh, Modern Warfare Two, and then I like borrowed my friend's copy of World at War, which had this weird multiplayer thing where for the first four levels it would put you only with other people who were in the first four levels. So it'd be like basically, you know, baby gamers. Right. And I remember playing that. And literally the first match that I played, I got like a 27 kill streak <laughs> in World at War because I was only playing against like other people who had never played the game before. And I was so mad because I was like, I've been trying this for months. And I <laughs> Um, my confessions are a little all over the place. I wasn't sure how this conversation would be tonally, but maybe this is a conversation starter. Um, there's a real part of me, uh, even when I'm not be feeling burnt out on games, as I sometimes have working in the industry, when sure. I've got games I like and stuff, there's still a part of me in there that is like, should I not be playing these at all? And Ooh, the biggie, okay. Not just because like they're a waste of time or whatever. Maybe I'd be more productive. Those kinds of thoughts. But like, are they reshaping my brain into being used to like unrealistic levels of uh, rewards? And it makes other yes. parts of my life that I could get more joy and fulfillment from a little less than because I do find my mind wandering sometimes of like, oh, I hope I get to play Hitman later. Hope I have time to to, to play the finals or whatever. You know, right? Like, we'll be discussing Stellar Blade happy. later on the podcast. <laughs> That's interesting. It, it makes me think of, you know, how used we, everybody is to like movies at this point and like, well, obviously if you set something up at the beginning, it's got to pay off in the end. And then this is why the randomness of life is soul crushing for a lot of folks. Um, <laughs> and I'm trying to think, Jacob, you seem like the person to ask about this. The phrase, everything happens for a reason. Do you think that took off? after movies <laughs> were in the mainstay. Like, I don't think people no. in the 1500s were saying everything happens oh, for a reason. I, that's, that's, that's like a religious. That's, that's why people yeah. invented religion is because yeah. the randomness <laughs> of life is unbearable. But I guess... But because it, they didn't have movies. They invented it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Movies but are my religion. Plays now. weren't cutting it. But it's not like that exact sentence is in the Bible. The sentiment, no, the, sure. It's it's like God has a plan is the same thing I guess as you're everything right. happens for a reason. You're right. Yeah, I, I actually always associate that phrase with with like religion. Like that's where. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Phrase, yeah. I definitely like, agree that that movies give people the impression that their life is going to have an arc. Right, right. That is beautiful and fulfilling. But it's more just video games for just satisfying rewards to going on a vacation. You expect to see a meter go up, say happiness fulfilled. <laughs> Yeah, right. And of course, you know, we all know that it's like healthy to distract your brain and games are like, I don't know, teach you stuff, keep your brain active is probably good for Alzheimer's or whatever. One of those studies is probably true. <laughs> so is it like guilt over enjoying a video game too much? Is that what it mean? is like scared of how much fun they are? <laughs> okay. I did have like a good other would I find have more fun doing other things if I didn't have uh, all my favorite games to compare them to. And because like I could have fun doing things that have more of an impact on me or my surroundings or my friends, maybe versus games being like confined to this little EXE on your computer. I, I think, I mean, it's like every time I finish a book, I am like more satisfied and I feel like my life is more enriched than almost any time I finish a game. And yet I still spend five times as much 
time playing games is reading a book. You yeah. know, it's like I, I yeah. definitely I felt the same way of like and and when I'm reading, I'm like so easily distracted by I'm like, I would be playing a Bellatro run right now. And then yeah. I'm like not kind of doing something that I feel like would permanently enrich my life <laughs> right. for for that same reason. I feel yeah, like even no, movies, too. It's like, wow, an hour and a half. And I feel complete after I feel like huh. this. I've I've done something worthwhile with my evening in a way that doesn't always come when I play games. It's like I had a start and a finish to a thing that I will continue thinking about and growing from and be inspired by, which, again, is just not always the case with games. It isn't always the case with movies, too, but I feel like it happens more often for the hours with movies than it does with games. Right. right. If every game was, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, and you got to finish it and have a little experience and a little package, a little bow on the end of it, you might feel differently, you know? Yeah, do it, it's probably the job, but like I do with video compared to other media with video games, I do feel like I'm always in a little bit of a race of like I do I want to play more. I want to, I want to, I want to see everything that's available. What if I miss a bad, a, a good game? You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I certainly don't feel that way about you know <laughs> television or movies or books or life, but I or life. Uh, here's one. <clears throat> Are we on me? No, we're on Kyle. Sorry, Kyle, you got to take it away now. Here's one oh, for Kyle. <laughs> Here's one. Yeah. Um, I have re- somewhat recently gained an appreciation for the the rogue genre. I was always very like, I, I, these games don't do it for me. And it, it would it would be like a turnoff to the point where I was like, I don't even want to play it if it's a rogue. Like, And I feel like people who felt similarly uh, crossed the line with Hades, where Hades mm. was like the one that, that pulled them over. Um but Hades just is like doesn't do it for don't me really. I, it, I beat Kyle. Hades. Don't do it. Don't do it. But this like to us. I undermine and yeah. Returnal, like I just think are just better games. Like Hades has the Undermine is art. a better game than Hades? I think I, I love I Undermine. Love undermine I don't more. agree, but I love it. <laughs> but like I it's like I love the art of Hades and the performance is good. Yeah. But like I the combat like doesn't really do it for me and the cycle of I think the thing that undermine and returnal do for me that I love so much is that like when you beat the boss it's like so satisfying to overcome that boss and then you kind of don't really excuse me have to like go after those bosses again like you can skip that part like that is the the summit that you've gotten over. And then the the challenges change yeah where undermine was or excuse me Hades was a game where I truly felt like I was just going the same path over and over and over again. Oh, I got to fight this boss again. I got to mm. fight this boss again. Mm. And that like style of gameplay was like, was a hurdle for me ultimately. Like Hades was one of those games where I was like, there's something here. Everyone really loves this. I like it. Okay. And maybe if I keep playing it, I will get over the hurdle mm-hmm. of like, and discover why it's magical. And I never hit that magical point with Hades. Okay. I was just kind of like, yeah, this is, this is cool. But like in terms of that genre, I would put undermine and returnal above Hades myself. Wow. Accept so Take that. Accept it. Hades. <laughs> uh, do y'all know what happens at the, the real end of near automata? Like the, the, the true e ending, ending or whatever. Um, yeah. Are you yeah. gonna spoil I it just to be clear? I beat that game once and didn't feel super compelled to try and beat it. Like, for okay, so you didn't beat it. Yeah. You just I, yeah, I didn't. I, I'm kind of with you, but hang on, Jacob. Just to be clear. We can put uh, spoiler timestamps. Are you gonna talk about details? Okay, of it? yeah, spoiler. Well, I I don't need to, but I I think it would be a better discussion if okay. I, spoiler timestamps. Like, yeah. I've heard what it is, and I already know what your confession's gonna be. Based yeah, well, it's like, it, it's on. kind of a two parter. Right. Okay, so spoiler spoilers for the end of the timestamps below. True, yeah, the true ending. Um, so at the end of near there is this you're presented with a choice which is essentially um you can you can have your your kind of character your save file can go on and help other people playing the game uh but your save file on your personal game will be permanently deleted yeah or you can keep it but then you don't help anyone else in the world and you're just kind of like selfishly you know, keeping your safe. How, how does it there. help people in the world? It like during the credits, the credits are like a a bullet hell shmup that is basically impossible to beat on your own. But then you get like other players, avatars that come okay. in and like help you do it. That's cool. Um, and so you know the the first the more obvious part of the confession is like I I chose the selfish option. I, you know, I, I kept my save file. I didn't go on to help other players. But the worst part is then I never played the game again. 
<laughs> so <laughs> I was kind of like, I was like, yeah, I'll keep this. I'm going to go back and do some side quests. And then I never went back and touched it again. And so it, it, it really feels like, you know, I know it's just a game, but it feels like it's like, well, I should keep my big pot of money because maybe right. one day I'll need it. And then like never touching that pot of money ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you mean all of society yeah i get it yeah uh <laughs> that's okay that's that's good that's good end of spoilers like seeing all the here. talk about nuclear warheads and Gear solid five and being like i should probably log in and, and see if i can help with that <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even want to like figure out how to do that i don't know what's going on there yeah. <laughs> I uh I, I have an odd one if i look in the mirror and really focus on how much passion and excitement do i have in my heart for this it's a rock bottom zero and i know it's sacrilegious but uh elden rings dlc shadow of the erd tree <laughs> if you just told me that that's never coming out i would not skip a beat i would truly yeah. not care <laughs> which i'm really trying to reason with because elden ring is my favorite game of that year i got into the groove in a way that i didn't expect i in theory, love my time with it, but I feel like my love for it, I just, I don't even remember what I liked about Elden Ring. When I think about it, it just feels like a fleeting thing. And I did all those bonus videos uh, with Grant and Ronnie in the studio unpacking my love. And I feel like I need to go back and watch those just to like remind myself of like how I fell in love with Elden Ring. But something about like, I'm not a big DLC guy. And just the idea of like, hey, there's more content and it's going to be really hard in that game where you only did 7% of the content, even though you beat it. It's like, I... No, I'm good. Thank you. Um, I I am scared of that of it being so hard that I like don't even make a dent in it. You know, because yeah. it's like I have to get back into the Elden Ring groove, it, which yes. is going to be tough on its own. And then to assume that it's going to be very challenging is just sort of intimidating. Um, so I I am I definitely have more excitement than your zero. Okay, but uh, I, I I would be much more excited about an Elden Ring too, which probably goes without saying. I, that's not that's not a hot take or anything. Like no, that. yeah, no, that's the thing. It's like Elden Ring was a certain groove, and I feel one hundred percent out of that groove, and I can't fit back mm -hmm. in. In my mind, maybe this will wow me, and it'll be like an old an old bicycle horse but i i like don't know I, to the point where you're just you're not going to play it I, i'll or play it think, i'll, I'll you know, try okay it. that's yeah. what i was wondering yeah, it's I, like i'll if, see you know. i'll see if i fit back in there but i well, just and, and i think the the challenging thing about it and I, I say this as someone who has recently started a new elden ring character right. i'm like you know 12 hours into a new elden ring playthrough it's like i don't know if you beat it like when you beat it i believe there's a choice to basically do you want to go to new game plus now or not and like, I think I think if you hit that new game plus choice, you actually won't even be able to use your character on the DLC unless you like play all the way back up and new game plus is harder. So like oh. I'm I'm worried for a lot of people who and it's like, I don't know if this is true, but like I, even accessing the DLC in from games is pretty hard usually. <laughs> and like the place that everyone thinks you're going to get you're going to like get into this dlc from is kind of like two-thirds of the way through the game you know and so it's like it's going to require investment but that being said having not played elden ring since it released yeah. you know in 2022 i've been playing it again i'm like oh yeah this is this is really good what, what, i, what's I hit, remember what's hitting you the hardest going back to it it it's so i did not remember how like pretty of a game mm. that is that like literally just like riding your horse around the world is this constantly kind of like awe inspiring like oh man look at look at the sky here look at that thing off in the distance look right. i can like go to there um and then it's just like that gameplay is just really fundamentally satisfying you know yeah. when when you beat a boss and you're like woohoo i did it you know it's like that still that still hits yeah you know ben so you you beat it right ben and then you're yeah. then you kind of what I did is I beat that game and then I did do New Game Plus and I did beat it again. Um, and like a fun thing for you to do ahead of the DLC might be to like dive into your new New Game Plus game and just wipe the floor with like the first like eight bosses. That does sound like fun. I found that yeah. to be some of the most fun I had in Elden Ring was doing New Game Plus and just like ripping what what previously took me like 30 hours. Right in like four hours because yep. that game is so open-ended you can just sort of ping pong to the bosses you need to get to and you're so strong it, it feels very good to well, back I, through I, that game 
I'm not sure if that's the experience that Ben would have, though, because the New Game Plus enemies are, they're harder and they do more damage. So I think that you oh, were, really? obviously, it's like your character is stronger, but I think you probably mostly had that experience because you had just played Elden Ring for 80 yeah. hours, <laughs> and so you were, like, good <laughs> at the game. Point. Right, yeah, right, right. I would never assume, I would never assume me that I would be good at a From game, though. I always <laughs> struggle my way through a From game, no matter yeah. what. I think that is interesting, though, Hanson. I think it goes either way sometimes of like, I have distance from this game and now it's clear that it really wasn't that special to me. And right. that doesn't sound like what Elden Ring is to, to most people, because yeah. lo- lots of times it is like uh, game of the year. You kind of got to trust your previous self. Yes, that's that talks that's so highly of this game because the feelings just aren't aren't in there that uh, close to you anymore. Yep. But then when you go back to it, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Even Jacob saying just riding your horse around, which is so stupid and obvious. Uh, I can't believe Jacob would say that. No, but just that idea of like, oh, that's right. Like, I, I remember being wowed by it, being like, oh, it has Shadow of the Colossus vibes so much more than yep. I was expecting. Um, and that really wooed me. Um, speaking of wooed, uh, by the way, uh, let us know in the comments uh, your gaming confession. And if you want to hear more from us or from a different crew, or if you hated that segment because we uh, diminished your love for your favorite game. Curious what y'all think of it. Uh, but speaking of woo, Jacob Geller has been wooed by the demo for Stellar Blade. Uh, Kyle, have you also played the demo for Stellar Blade? Yeah, I've also been wooed. Ooh. Uh, I'm, I'm in camp woo. Okay. Um, you, maybe you have wooed. Cut that out. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, this Cut is the out. game from Shift Up, uh, the South Korean studio. It is a PlayStation 5 exclusive, um, but not a first party game. But it's cool to see Sony uh, pushing a stylish action game as if it were a first party game. Um, you might remember this one. It was announced as Project Eve. And even at that uh, announcement trailer, Jacob Beller said, Ah, uh, what is this? I am so into this. <laughs> Um, I said, awooga. Basically. My eyes popped out of my head and my tongue <laughs> and rolled started down. whistling. So the big <laughs> discourse awoo. around this game is, yeah, uh, the character is buxom, voluptuous, uh, best way to put it, Bayonetta-esque. Um, they know their audience and the internet has a lot of opinions about that. Yeah, it's... It's like I want to talk. I want to talk about the stuff that I really like please, about the game please. first, because that's going to take up some time. But like the, it it instantly had like way higher production value. Yes. than I was expecting. Not not just in kind of like the graphics are good because now I almost feel like in you know in the age of like Unreal Five and whatever, it's like most double triple A games have like good lighting and stuff. But like the opening cutscene to this game is like. It it reminds me very of like like early platinum, kind of like a vanquish or something, where right. it's like this big scene of like spaceships flying towards a planet and like giant lasers are firing at the spaceships and everything has like a pretty cool design and like you know the escape pods are like shooting out of these giant spaceships in like interesting patterns and there's a lot of just like really cool design work yeah uh, because going then, on there and it like crashes on earth then uh well yeah and you see just a giant monster in the distance like this weird plant thing that's like covered in pubic hair it's like i'm a sucker for any huge thing wandering around in the distance and like this game immediately is given it to you but yeah that was my like exact first, impression too is like the budget it seems a lot higher than i was expecting yeah like the first the first 20 minutes at least are putting like a lot of money on the screen yes um and and like also kind of along that line, it's like the music is really good. It, it has it. It feels very much like near music, you know, to the point that you could maybe call it derivative even. But it's like, I'm fine with that because <laughs> near Automata has the best soundtrack ever put in a game. So if there are more games hmm. that like sound yeah. like near, you know, that's that's fine with me. Um, to side on the music, like real quick, it, it's also mixed in a really cool way. Where like they crank the volume at certain times, but like the song stays consistent. So they're just like, I mean, I know that's not like some crazy technological advancement or something, but it really hit me harder here because it's like uh, music with like a woman singing. It's like lyrical music. Yeah. And it just feels like the way it feels is like when you're exploring, it's just kind of like she's like almost humming in the background. And then when you're in combat, she starts just like really singing her heart out. It really it really worked for me really well. It was really cool. Um, yeah, and then and then the combat itself is uh, is really fun. You know, I think people have been uh, in in uh, a small corner of the annoying discourse about this game. Uh, I, it it does not play like Bayonetta, even though mm. it kind of looks like it would play like Bayonetta. It's not. I've also seen people saying that it's slow and kind of soulsy. I don't think that's accurate either. But it is like between those two, where like 
it is like a counter heavy combat system uh you know you're you're throwing out combos but they're not the like incredibly fast acrobatic kind of cancel one into another combos that that something like bayonetta or you know metal gear rising has um but like it feels it feels weighty it feels good the demo does a really cool thing where when you beat it they let you fight a later boss with like all of your skills unlocked and so it's like hey here's what the game is gonna feel like after you've played for like 20 hours and like getting there and kind of seeing the number of options that you're going to have later on in the game. Right. I was like, oh, this is, you know, this is like a very competent action game in a way that's like not quite, you know, not quite Devil May Cry or, or Bayonetta, but like it, it's it got satisfying combat, which is what I want out of it. But more action RPG than stylish action game. Is that kind of the. I, somewhere between there it does sure. have a big skill tree uh that you're gonna be unlocking things from but the skills don't seem you know they're not i think you're ultimately just going to unlock ev- all of them like i don't think it's really an rpg and you're like deciding what style of character you want to have I, right i was surprised that it feels more unless i was playing it wrong like it, it it i thought it would be more like you're fighting a lot of enemies at once but to me, it felt like more like you walk up to an enemy and you're facing off one on one, like primarily mm-hmm. like there are instances where there are a lot of enemies, but mostly you're just kind of circling another enemy and making sure you're doing counters and stuff at the right time. Like the dodge button initially, I felt like wasn't even that useful. Like it's not like you can tap dodge a lot to get out of the way. Like you have to use dodge carefully. There's there's certain sections, Jacob, where I was like. This has a certain wanted dead vibe. Is that why Jacob's into it? Like obviously better or higher quality, but like just that that style, the vanquish, wanted dead, just kind of the weird sci-fi video game vibe. You know, it's a very distinct aura. Yes, it definitely it definitely has that. And that's kind of, you know, that is good the good and some of the bad. But like, yeah, the enemy designs are like weird enough to be cool. The bosses are neat. The yeah. you know, finishers are like gory in a fun way and uh clearly there's been a lot of work put into the character you're playing as you know and some of that i it's like when you when you have that like later boss unlocked you can also kyle i actually saw you did like a little video on this for game informer but it's like they give you a bunch of outfits for the character to wear and like some of those are really cool they're like oh she's in like a leather jacket now or she's in kind of like a racing uniform and like that's that's all fine uh but but then there's the elephant in the room of uh you know when you go up a ladder her boobs look like they're gonna fly off her chest (laughs) that's why women can't use ladders i was gonna ask how much of a real factor that is because every because it's it's already been annoying how much it's the conversation around this it it's really you know it's like for me playing the game it's kind of a like all right this is this is the choice they've made i guess you know it like it doesn't detract from the gameplay for me um i don't think it really makes sense in the way that it's like when we talk about it's like bayonetta is this like tall sexy you know kind of like a a very sex symbol of gaming character but also it's like bayonetta as a character is that person you know she is like she has a very dominatrix vibe she like when she talks she's constantly making kind of innuendos she's like sexually confident all of this none of that is really present so far in the character that you're playing in this and so it just seems like she's kind of randomly has like (laughs) a ridiculous body that jiggles all the time you know and it's like people do randomly have that yeah she can help it that is true (laughs) Um, but you know, the, the, the unavoidably negative thing for me is that there is a, a certain section of the, uh, the internet who has basically decided that like, like the people online who think that Aloy is like, um, uh, the ugliest person that they've ever seen, you know, are kind of viewing this character as like, haha, take that Western devs. Here's, here's a studio who still knows how to make a sexy lady. It's like, I don't think that's the majority of people. I think no. if you think that you're kind of a sociopath, but like, unfortunately, <laughs> even if you go to like the game subreddit, which I have unfortunately been on, it's like for every two posts about the gameplay feeling good, there are like three posts about her ass. And so it just 
it feels like a lot of the people who are really excited about this game yeah are excited not just because she's sexy but because they feel that sexiness has somehow been taken away from them in other games and this is giving it back it's the justin timberlake of games yeah i thought it was interesting push square had an interview <laughs> with shift up the developers and it just because i just heard whispers of the internet melting down over this discourse uh but push square's interview with the developers they say can you explain what makes stellar blades combat system unique compared to other character action games on playstation 5 and the developer's response is Battles occur with an attractive female protagonist who uses a blade. <laughs> it's like that's their opening sentence describing the battle system. <laughs> like, yeah. All right, sure. Why it's, not? it's also worth noting. It's like there hasn't been a lot of Western reporting on this, mm. but like there were there were developers who said that they were fired from Shift Up for being feminist, uh, specifically, um, oh, and really? and like How like developers who used to work in the studio and the. The the lead of that studio, the lead of this game, has given several interview answers that I think are pretty unsavory. Okay. Um, so it's like it's hard to say because this is all kind of like getting translated and filtered through things. But like I, I, I don't blame anyone who feels like there are bad vibes coming off kind of everything surrounding this game because sure. I I kind of think they're right. <laughs> But yes, sure. Stellar Blade coming out April 26. I'm curious to to see if the Nier fans, if the Bayonetta fans grab onto this one. Um, it's it, it's it's cool. It, you know, I, I'm i curious how much of a splash Rise of the Ronin had. And I feel like that's kind of the one-two punch from Sony this year where they're trying to make up for their first-party games taking longer and longer development and trying to build up these second-party experiences. And Rise of the Ronin, I'm curious if there's a lot of folks out there loving it, but it doesn't seem like it made a huge splash. I'm curious if Stellar Blade will kind of uh, fill that gap and feel like a, a hot PS5 exclusive. But April 26, we'll learn more about it. Um, another game that, Kyle, I know you're looking forward to in a big, bad way, uh, a game called Pepper Grinder, published oh. by Devolver Digital. Uh, why? Where'd yeah. you think I was going to go with that, Kyle? I don't know. I, I, I thought you said a game you are looking forward to in a big, oh. bad way. And I was like, what am I? Was I supposed to prepare something? <laughs> <laughs> and the floor is yours. Go. Uh, no, yeah, no, Pepper Grinder. Uh, yeah, I know. That, that it was, um, it's in that kind of, uh, I, it's a genre I like, right? Where it's like throwback platformer, pixelated, yeah. you know. And um, Pepper Grinder also has a little bit of that like Drill Dozer energy. And I yep. love Drill Dozer so much. But ultimately, they're very different. Drill yes. Dozer is basically uh, almost borderline like a puzzle game. And this is like the almost like the swimming sections of Rayman, uh, Rayman Legends and Origins. Yeah. It's kind of like what this feels the closest to. Or even the Ori uh, power. It's just like anytime in a 2D game, you're kind of like swimming through yeah. an environment in that way. Yeah, totally. And you're doing yeah, it with it, a drill here. And uh, it, it, it's good. I, I'm not I'm not over the moon for it. Yeah. Uh, I finished it. It's like four worlds and each of those worlds has like five levels, I think. So it's like, it's not a very long game. And there were moments, there were a couple boss fights that I was sort of hitting my head against where I was like, yeah, this feels like like a challenge spike I, I wasn't really ready for. Yeah. Um, but like overall, like super solid, like just a good devolver sort of 16-bit platformer with like a unique hook that doesn't overstay its welcome. Right. Yeah, I was, It's it feels so good to swim through the environments, drill through the environments, collect the coins and gems and all that stuff in there. Then it's like, okay, is this a mechanic in search of a game? Do you, do you feel like they, they find that though as the game evolves, that it keeps evolving and changing? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I, like, like I said, I, I, was, I was impressed with like h how often I was kind of doing different things that were sort of still drill associated. Like there's like, there's like a couple levels where you like get in a mech, you know, and you're like controlling the mech, like with your, with your drill sort of. And it's, it's good about like mixing it up and like giving you new abilities. And later you're like swimming through water, which does feel different from like swimming through the ground. Yeah. Um, and it is a game where it's like, it could have been twice as long, but I don't think it would have benefited it. Right. Like they could have had like, you know, four water levels instead of just two. And like, I don't know if that would have been necessary, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's lacking in some ways in that, like, it, it's a little finicky. Like I, I did struggle sometimes with, with the sort of launching out of the ground to, to, to make a gap. And then like, there was a couple instances this is like a weird thing to complain about, I suppose, where like I would launch out of the ground to try to to like get to another platform and I wouldn't make it. 
um, but then the save point would just be like, eh, you made it. And it would like throw me on the on the on the platform, which is like okay, because it's like, well, the alternative is I would just be getting annoyed mm-hmm. by, you know, having to redo this thing over and over. But it's like to just sort of let me continue without actually having completed the goal. I don't I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know if that's if that's the right answer necessarily. Yeah. You know um, what this game has, Pepper Grinder? Uh, what's that? In the exact same way as Elden Ring and Stellar Blade. In the opening, it has a big thing walking in the background uh, that you see walk by, just a weird blue <laughs> uh, cool. monster thing, which is pretty sweet. But you do interact with that thing later in a fun way that I, was, uh, I wasn't expecting, and I was like, that's cool. Nice. Uh, also, Secret, uh, the art style is awesome, if you haven't seen it. Uh, it looks great. Um, secretly, I think, perfect name. Like, it, yeah. it, it, you wouldn't expect it, but like it's memorable, it connects to what's going on in the game just enough, but it's funky. It, yeah. I, I love the name Pepper Grinder. It feels right, but you can't explain yes. why. Yes, yeah. Like, because it's like technically like the Pepper Grinder is not associated <laughs> a drill? with like drilling. <laughs> but I guess just the twist. Like you're like, rotating something, yeah. but it, it's like, no, no, that's they they named it correctly, even yep. though I don't think I ever encountered any pepper throughout the course of the game. <laughs> that's DLC, I think. It's just like a whole cooking minigame thing. Uh, Kyle, I was playing Pepper Grinder for a little bit, and then I said, well, I know Kyle's going to bring up Drill Dozer, and I've never played Drill Dozer on the Game Boy Advance from Game Freak. So I then booted up uh, Drill Dozer and played a little bit of that oh, so nice. I have the a comparison. I wasn't expecting it to to be kind of like a a slower experience. Obviously, Pepper Grinder, you're flying, right? But it is just kind yeah. of stomping around with a drill, slowly going through these environments in front of you. But then I also didn't know that I had like a weird like shifting mechanic where you're like drilling and then you got to like shift Gearing up your up drill yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and then funky. the cartridge i i'm assuming you didn't play it on a cartridge i did the not cartridge actually had a rumble feature oh really um, yeah which was like unique for game boy advance i was i was thinking of like that feels like the perfect i mean i'm, I'm a sucker for it i love that's like my favorite game freak non pokemon game like i think it's the best game that they've ever made that's not called pokemon um if you bash like, little town hero one more time Kyle, <laughs> so help me god uh a game that just left a, a mark on spotify and nothing else um i i that's got that's i i want that to come to nintendo switch online right because it's like it is like it's it's niche enough, mm-hmm. right? Like it's I not think, a game yeah. that maybe could be sold on its own, right? All the Castlevania Game Boy Advance games like won't come there because it's like, well, we can sell Aria of Sorrow mm-hmm. uh, separately, said Konami, and I don't blame them. But Drill Dozer feels like like cool enough and niche enough and also but not popular enough where it would it should it would get like its own remaster that's like i i hope they should bring drill dozer to nintendo switch online i i love that game and it, it it leaves it open for a sequel in a way that i was like i was always bummed that there was never a drill dozer too yeah uh there's another game from 2023 i love it that jacob said he's been playing jacob what brought you around to a game called bramble the mountain king <laughs> all right i was just looking at games that i had wishlisted on steam just kind of i can't remember i don't think this was one uh, last year when at the end of the year we had that like indie games you might have missed yeah. wrap up where yeah. people listed like 70 games mm-hmm. and i i put a lot of those on there and have like checked in on a lot of them i can't remember if bramble was one but it just it had pretty good reviews yeah and the sorry there's a cat in my face <laughs> um the you know, the kind of like appeal of like, hey, really dark fairy tale, kind of scary, but also like folklore uh, sounded good to me. Uh, and I checked it out and and it is. Yeah, it has a you pitched it to Kyle as like, if you like little nightmares, Bramble the Mountain King might be up your alley, too. Yes, it's very I don't know if we have like a genre name for them yet, but I would. I would pitch if someone else hasn't already made this up like experiential platformer or right. something where mm. it's like the actual gameplay is not that complicated. And there is a lot of just kind of like, oh, there's something happening in the background and you have to like, you know, there's like a shockwave and you have to like run between things to hide behind. All of these things are kind of just, you know, basing their gameplay off like inside or, or yeah. limbo or yeah. something. It's played um, at a genre. I don't know. Yeah. It should yeah. Be. <laughs> um, but like the 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 Scandinavian folklore aspect on this is like really they got some messed up fairy tales, man. <laughs> and like the the ways that this game is both like very cute sometimes and then like 
legitimately horrifying in like i think i think there are horror sections of this game that are like better than than most little nightmares stuff just in terms of like the imagery and the kind of like effects that they're putting on screen yeah um so i i really enjoyed it i thought it was a really cool game oh that's sweet yeah it came out Did April you it? last year yes nice uh bramble uh, oh uh four hours maybe um they should make some time for this huh I like yeah this i i think it's you know it, it it was like a a two sitting game for me um you know maybe maybe more but like i i think you would dig it kyle it has it has the kind of like cute and also messed up uh kind <laughs> of like contrast that is just fun yeah i mean i guess i could read a book or something in four <laughs> hours come on a children's book absolutely not uh Two movies <laughs> bramble the mountain king everybody uh check it out from last year uh hey uh kyle do you know oh actually kyle I don't want to ask you this. I've been thinking, Leo, Uh-oh. do you know how this whole thing operates? Yeah, man, it's, uh, uh, the Leo. It's Who's practicing Leo. <laughs> I where I just, I, as soon as you're going to say it, I'm going to be like, oh yeah, that. <laughs> Leo. Come on, man. Um, there's a, E in it. Yeah. And I think it's in the back half. Patreon.com slash minmax with two ends, everybody. (laughs) Patreon.com slash minmax with two ends. If you enjoy this type of content, you can directly support this type of content just if you want to. If you'd like to support us, uh, we appreciate it. And there's a bunch of benefits over there on that site. Patreon.com slash minmax with two ends. Find the tier that's right for you. Find something sustainable, and that keeps us sustainable as well. So thanks, everybody, who jumped up to the Backstage Pass tier, the $10 tier, to check out the three-and-a-half-hour tour of GDC 2024. Uh, I appreciate all the kind words and views on that thing. Um, And thank you to some of our biggest supporters. Uh, Thank you to Squarespace. This podcast is brought to you by Squarespace. Leo, you remember Squarespace? I remember it from paying for it. (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) You used it, eh? Uh, Yeah, it's what I've made my website on, leobader.com. And that's why it's one of the greatest sites online. Uh, Genuinely, Leo, we didn't rehearse this. Uh, What was your experience with Squarespace there? Amazing. Their support is awesome. On the ball so fast, and they'll like... You'll ask them how to do something and they'll send you a customized video of them clicking through the menus and getting to exactly what you need. Really? Wow. Oh, that it's is really sweet. Uh, they also offer courses. They say Squarespace has the tools you need to create and sell your online course. Uh, start with a layout that fits your brand, upload videos, and customize everything with next generation editing technology. You can create engaging lessons your audience will love, then add a paywall and set the price. You can charge a one-time fee or sell subscriptions. Take what you know and turn it into income with Squarespace courses. You can offer courses on your site. They have a whole layout ready for it. But Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online, just like Leo Vader. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to time, all in one place, all on your terms. It's just like that Justin Timberlake movie, Leo. Uh, Squarespace blueprint and SEO tools they also have. You can start a completely personalized website with the new guided design system, Squarespace blueprint. You can choose from professionally curated layout and styling options to build a unique online presence from the ground up, tailored to your brand or business. So Gamers love blueprints. They love them. Discovering them? (laughs) That's right. Discover the only one that matters, Squarespace uh, blueprint. Go to squarespace.com. You get a free trial for building a site. When you're ready to launch, you can go to squarespace.com slash minmax to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. Uh, you should have a site. It still comes up all the time where people will be like, does MinMax have a site? And it's like, yes, absolutely we have a site. If you have a company, even a small company, get a site up and running and Squarespace can help you in a huge way there. You all- keep it updated even. You keep that site current. Uh, did you see that? Well, it's nice, like the playlist on the MinMax site, I just have it set to the playlist so the videos all update automatically. It's pretty sweet. Uh, also, thank you to our dear friends at I Am 8-Bit. They want everybody to know about Vampire Survivors, the double vinyl soundtrack for Vampire Survivors. You know I Am 8-Bit's cool because 
They have the Vampire Survivors vinyl soundtrack available on their site. You pop that sucker on, that's some good idle listening, we call it. Uh, the album art is by uh, Nimit Malavia. Check it out. Music by Danielle Zandara and Will Davies. It is available in I Am 8-Bit's wonderful online store, in addition to a ton of other great gifts or just cool things to have as a gamer and beyond. You can check out I Am 8-Bit's wonderful online store and you can use the promo code... Ready for this? It's a new promo code for April. <clears throat> Shout out to Seth from I Am 8-Bit for coming up with all these. Shower power, everybody shower power no space and you get 10 percent off of everything in i made bits wonderful online store under 100 so please check that out and help support i made bit because they have been so kind to the min max community every single week every week i made bit ships out a prize to the min max community whoever has the best question submitted over there on patreon so Whoever has the best question this week, as we deem it, they're going to win the Stray Vinyl Soundtrack. Let's deem it. All right. Uh, Backstage Pass, you're on the screen, so everybody look alive uh, for the video version. If you're at the $10 tier, your chat's on the screen. You're watching us record it live. Um, Sean Kennedy wrote in. Can you believe this? Mr. Kennedy himself. Sean Kennedy. Uh, He says, with the release of Pepper Grinder last week, do we think enough about how Leon Kennedy, his last name is Kennedy? No, Whoa. he's actually yeah. he is a Kennedy. He, that's why he's cursed. Yeah. The curse of the Kennedys. And in, in Resident Evil Six, he killed the president, which is pretty messed up because he that's wasn't right. a fellow Kennedy. <laughs> uh, with the release of Pepper Grinder uh, last week, I've noticed that many of the reviews. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, he's killing someone with his own last name. Does that make him a cannibal or something? I don't want to just run away from that. I feel he like. is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he is Kenuff. Oh, that's good. Ken- okay, we got Ken- it. Enough of the D. Like you can't I, just like drop half the name. <laughs> has anyone done like an "I'm just Ken" with Leon? Or oh, somebody? Yeah. Did, yeah, I'm just yeah, I'm just Ken, but it's just like JFK footage. Not the footage you're thinking of, Kyle. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, regular footage. Let me yeah. don't know that. <laughs> think, think of the second video you think yeah, of with right. JFK. <laughs> why don't we? Yeah, why don't you work up that video, Ben, and throw it on the min max okay. channel? <laughs> 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 oh, I'm sorry. Okay, with the release of Pepper Grinder last week, I've noticed that many of the reviews had nothing but praise, but cite the relatively short runtime. Venba ran into this as well. It made me wonder if people reviewing games are wimps. No, it made me wonder if the game was twice as long at that same level of quality, how that might affect the reception of the game. When reviewing games, how do you reconcile the overall playtime as a factor? Do you try to ignore it? Does it depend on the genre? This is this is tricky because I I feel it I hear you when people listen to gaming podcasts with game reviewers and everyone just complains about how long every game is all the time. There's too many games to play. It's like eh, not my problem. I don't care. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I mean, how, how do you me, reconcile that for a review? For for me, it's like it, it, the the like Pepper Grinder. It, it was less. I didn't I didn't review Pepper Grinder ultimately, but like to me, it felt more of just like a relevant detail. As opposed to like a, a, a factor, a, like it's too short or it's not, it's not long enough or anything like that. Yeah. But for me, it's like length comes down to like, was I like interested the whole time? Like, I think it's something yes. people reading a review want to know about. And it's like, sometimes it's a matter of pace. You know, if it's like this game feels too long, that's a problem. But if it's like, I was just totally engaged the whole time where I looked at my hour count and I was like, wow, I can't believe how long I've been playing it. I think that speaks positively to the game. Right. You know? And just easier to do if it's a shorter experience. But I think of like Resident Evil 4, you know, I'm just like, okay, great pacing throughout that entire yeah. game. And it's not a short game necessarily, you know, but st- you would. Because like if it, if it feels long, that it's not necessarily that it's like, oh, they made this game too many hours. It's like they just mm-hmm. didn't make it interesting enough to sustain that time, you know? Yeah. Like, I, think, I, I mean, never I... felt like Tears of the Kingdom was too long, even right. though I yep. played more of that than like, anything else in 2023 i think games are more often too long than too short uh at least sure. in my experience where i feel like more games kind of it's like they stop being cool before the credits roll but like i do think about last year i thought that like viewfinder was too short Ooh, in that like i i they I, and it wasn't it wasn't just like a i want more but it like it felt like that game almost did not get to flesh out its mechanics in the way that 
you would want it to because it just kind of ended after like two hours. Um, and so like I have I have definitely had that thing where I feel like it's like I feel like you didn't actually get to do like as many cool things as were possible with this premise is sometimes a problem with shorter games with with Venba. I kind of just wanted more cooking sections. So mm. I also would have liked that game being a little longer just because you cook like, um, I don't know, seven meals in that game. And I would have happily had like twice that many. Yeah. Um, but I it is I mean, it's like if if the money that you're paying for games is not an issue, which is the case for us more than kind of people at home. Generally, it's yeah, I think I think it's a problem that games are long more often than, than being short because we get games for free, not because we're rich. Yeah, correct. <laughs> uh, my, I, I, my thought on that is that uh, reviewers are always going to be more impacted by longer games because they have to finish them even after they stop liking them versus like a consumer or me who doesn't review games can be like, I love this game. And as soon as I got tired of it for two thirds of the way through, I dropped it and I still have a lot of love for it versus like it'll just get more frustrating the the more you have to stick it out. Yeah, I do wonder, you know, it always it's interesting just, you know, how circumstances where people review games, play games, how that affects the mood. Like, I do worry about somebody like Jacob Geller with Rebirth, like, flying through the thing right after Like a Dragon. You know, like, that's that's so much game to cram in such a short time. Yeah. Like, d- does that hurt your experience of it in some ways? And I'm not. This is where it gets delicate. Uh, but also then coming out talking about it before the rest of the world has played it and then just getting lambast and just lit up online for saying some of the side quests are mid it's like I yeah think and then all it that, turns out that as time's gone on everyone is agreeing with jacob me. i don't know if you listen to the latest episode of the deepest dive but we have a whole jacob geller apology tour we're like i love that game <laughs> i love that game so much but is it all about the chicken side quest it's is yeah like, we, we really go deep from? <laughs> we do go deep on the clanger um but no <laughs> it, clanger. we talk about that idea of just like jacob geller you, you were you were so spot on and that's such a tough spot to be in to try and convey what it's like to play Rebirth before the rest of the world has played it. Uh, and then, yeah, I think I think that conversation is holding up really well, even though, and you like the game, to be clear, but like, yeah. even though I love the game, I think you were spot on with that first discussion about that game. Uh, anyways, uh, let's see. Uh, Mars Barrow writes in and says, do you think that we will have in our lifetime game experiences that we will be unable to distinguish from reality? And if so, would you be willing to experience said games? I personally would be reluctant to jump into that type of game, but I'm curious to see how new technologies will get us closer to those possibilities. So this is basically you lie on a a gray mat and then it just kind of like takes over your brain and convinces your brain that this is reality for a period of time. Basically like a gaming as an acid trip, I guess is the, the gist of it, right? That's interesting because I actually thought about this in... I was thinking maybe in a more in a more practical way or like a in in 10 years way where I was like, I could picture a a VR experience where you are like playing a character who's like handcuffed or in a straight jacket or something. And so it's almost literally like a film, but like you can like look around and, you know, more more like a like a, a, a perfect 3D film where you are the main character and you're playing it in VR. And I feel like that will actually happen relatively soon and might be indistinguishable from real life. But like, you'd still know you were playing a game, right? Is this like you'd lose track of reality? Ready player indistinguishable, yeah, is a tall order, right? Like, you'd, yeah. you'd have no sense. Like, if you woke Does up... Does it like wipe my brain? No, no. But if you woke up with a VR headset on your face, you wouldn't know the well, difference, you know? I mean, there's that scene in in Ruddy Player One, right, where he he doesn't realize he's not in his office. It like he's in VR, but he thinks he's in his office. Oh, sure. Right. I don't think we'll ever, ever, ever hit that. Like, I think we will always innately know that it's a simulation because as, as time goes on, like we just always will get better. Like I always, I think of a Jeff Cork once was talking about Soul Calibur mm-hmm. on Dreamcast. And at the time that that game released, he was like, this is it. Like, graphics will never mm-hmm. get better, which I always just thought was like a funny anecdote. And like, I, I, 
I, I think we will like as graphics get better and better, like we will st- always be able to see the matrix of it all. Like we will get better at seeing it. I just don't think there's ever going to be a period where we're like, we can't tell the difference <laughs> between an animated character and a human being. Like, I just don't think we'll ever get there. If hey. you've ever seen those steam reviews where they are really objective and just have the check boxes of the different levels of quality, it's like gameplay, whatever graphics, yeah. A pretty good, amazing, and the top ones you forget what reality is, that box will finally be checked. <laughs> <laughs> I I feel like we might get if people if people at some point get like neural implants, I could imagine something kind of like actually altering your brain yes. waves. So it's not yeah. even like someone has made graphics that you are seeing, yep. but more like you are like remembering a situation, but you're seeing it as if it's happening now in the same way that like, you know, when you dream, like it, I think if you could see a dream, you wouldn't be like, wow, bad graphics because it's like your <laughs> brain creating things. That's um, that's the plot of Ready Player Two, like is that it's people basically are able to record l- memories live. And then that becomes the sort of thrilling experience that people seek is like, that you can just live people's memories. Is brain dancing from Cyberpunk. Yes, yeah. is exactly what it is, yeah. Um, Actually, it's memories from Ready Player Two. Oh, <laughs> I'm saying, whoa, 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 I'm sorry. A book, by out. the way, I started and got like two-thirds of the way through, and I was like, I think I'm good. <laughs> ah, the, the Leo game treatment, that's interesting. Exactly, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. how I treated that book. I was like, I don't, I don't, have to I don't know if I need to finish this. Yeah, get off your high horse books. <laughs> Ready yeah, Player Ready Two player isn't good. Two, the, <laughs> the so epitome about, of literature. <laughs> What's so great about books too is you can just have it open to the page you finish on and yeah. just cut it with a kitchen knife. <laughs> the book ends there. Now. Yeah, I actually snapped my Kindle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I do like that idea, Jacob. I'm thinking about this. And look, everyone, you're listening early in the morning, so everyone just chill and relax as you think about this. But I do like the idea of like, what if? The games of the future, it's just, it's not so much like a digital thing. It's just b- getting better and better at fooling human senses. And if it is kind of jacking into the brain in that way, it's like, it is just rearranging how we're perceiving reality. And that's what we're making games out of compared to coding. I don't know. Would coding, J- Leo, I'm going to ask you, would technically programming be involved if we are rearranging how we perceive reality for our senses and that's what games of the future look like? No, that's a spell. <laughs> oh, that's a spell. I'm sorry. Yeah, they're just <laughs> wizards. Yeah. Um, but it'd be just like a Velox from Pendragon, right, Jacob? That's right. You, Can we unpaywall you. that Pendragon discussion? Was that paywalled? <laughs> Was it? I just don't think no, anybody I, watched it. I think no one listened to this. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, check behind out. the paywall, right? Maybe that's time for it to come forward. Well, that's what he said. I, I forget. Let's oh, figure it out. Okay. I think it is behind the paywall, yeah. Oh, that's a classic mistake. All right, we can we can release that. Release the Pendragon! That. I want 100,000 subscribers. Here we come. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie Clay writes in and says, Hey, gang. Uh, what are we thinking about Judas now that Ken Levine has had a chance to properly explain the narrative Legos thing? Um, The pitch is cool, but it seems so difficult to make happen. I'm pretty skeptical as to how it'll actually play out. Kind of feel like there'll be loads of decisions, quote unquote, where you're playing, but will ultimately lead to like one of three endings. I'm loving, though, that some developers recently are prioritizing new systems and ideas over graphical prowess. Absolutely. If you don't remember uh, Judas, this is the game that was revealed not too long ago. Uh, Ken Levine of Bioshock fame after Bioshock Infinite, he said, I want a small team and I want to work on a project about narrative Legos. And uh, that result was Judas, um, which is coming out in the future. He's not putting a date on it at this point. Um, I do love the idea of it is a triple A game. You know, Take Two is publishing this thing, 2K. Um, They're publishing this thing and it is a triple A roguelike game with procedural generation. I think that's a cool idea. I think it'll be the biggest budget rogue game ever made. I mean, it's got to be at this point. And so I'm I curious mean, to see. Returnal. Yeah. It, uh, it'll probably be bigger than Returnal just I, because what it's was been I cooking it for so long. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But uh, Friends Per Second, uh, Friends of the Show, that podcast over there, they had a, a preview where they got to play five hours of the game and talk to Ken Levine about it and experience it. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to listen to their thoughts on the game because they're like, look, it's so early. We're not going to tell you if we think this is good or bad, but like this is this is what the game is ultimately. And it's interesting just to hear their breakdown of all that stuff. But yeah, the big shocker was like, oh, it is it is a rogue game. You know, like you go into it and you think, oh, it's Bioshock in space, yet not System Shock. This is Bioshock in space. But then, oh, no, no, like you die. 
you fully reset. And then a little bit like Hades, when you die, there's like a larger meta story telling the backstory of the character of Judas, it seems like. Um, but the premise is you're on the space station that's called the Mayflower. Um, and there are pilgrims. There are people that call themselves the pilgrims on the Mayflower, of course, as well. You're saying Ken Levine? <laughs> it's very Ken Levine. <laughs> and it's interesting in that discussion, they talked to Ken Levine about that. What the idea of like, okay, there's certain aspects of this that feel more autobiographical than stuff he's done in the past. And it's interesting that there's also, you remember in the latest trailer, there's that section where somebody was like on a stage and there were like hands flying out, like emojis of like thumbs down, thumbs up and all this stuff. There's like on the ship, there's kind of like a social media function. Um, and if you stray in your messaging and people's posts on the social media platform stray too far from the correct discourse, they get downvoted and booed upon. And it's like, okay. This is... Uh... Jacob and Leo. This is a Meow Meow Beans situation. Mm. This, this feels like it's like anyone who's been a public figure for long enough. It's like every stand up now. They only like complain about Twitter. Yes. It's like this is just like, OK, Ken Levine's been like a guy who's been talking and people have been saying his ideas are dumb for long enough that now he's like, oh, I have to make something about social media. <laughs> There's a little bit of that. And even in the, you know. Preview, not quite a preview that French per second did. They said, you know, some of it's a little heavy handed, but the game's early. Maybe they can finesse some of this stuff on that front. Um, but it sounds interesting. And so then you're kind of like choosing who there's only like, I think, three or four other humans on the ship. And you're kind of choosing who to piss off and who to side with and all this stuff. But the idea of like procedurally generated spaceship with a Bioshock style combat, like I think it's an interesting pitch and I'm curious to see more about it. Um Leo, is that is that uh, tickling your senses at all? I I already worry having to go. Well, the other parts are good. The gameplay is good. Okay. You know, I kind of see that in my in my future because I, heavy-handed stuff, uh, symbolism, whatever, doesn't uh make me groan. Doesn't like ruin the experience for me, mm -hmm. even if it's obvious. Same. It's like I, I don't mind know. some overt. Like sometimes it sometimes you kind of need to be hit over the head with it a little bit. And like sure. it doesn't, it doesn't bug me that much. I mean, it, it can obviously, but um, yeah, what I if mean, I, I feel like Kojima is very heavy handed and I eat that right up. So <laughs> it, it kind of reminds me the narrative Legos thing. Um, Leo, did you play a uh, pray moon crash? Uh, not really. We streamed it once. Yeah, here. It, because it, it reminds me of like moon crashes thing was like, you're a bunch of, it was like it was it was an expansion or DLC to pray, but it was like a completely different setting. And it was basically like you had a bunch of different characters and you were all trying to get off a moon, I think. But it was like if you did something as one character that would actually lock off uh, things for the other. You know, it's like if you used an escape pod as one guy, you couldn't use that escape pod as someone else because like your first guy had already taken it. And that's kind of what I thought of when uh when he was talking about kind of like you're going to be doing this with multiple characters and yeah. one will affect the other i assume judas will be more complex but like moon is it moon crash or moon crush moon crash um moon crash it, like that was a that's a space station roguelike you know where you're playing as multiple characters and their decisions affect each other so i'd be interested to see if if people start making connections between those yeah that'll be fun to see um also the interesting thing is he was talking about ghost story games which is kind of the the rebooted irrational studio and all that stuff um you can check out jason schreier's books for kind of an interesting dissection of i think his most recent book was the one that went into that idea of like did he need to do this did he need to shut down irrational just to do this it seems bizarre but um they talk he talks about how Technically, the structure within Take Two is like, you know, he, he's very thankful. Like, we've been really lucky. Take Two has let us, like, cook with this weird idea for a decade now, over a decade, which is wild. Um, but he said that the studio, Ghost Story Games, they're technically a publisher within the structure of Take Two. So Take Two, it's like 2K is part of it. Rockstar is part of, part of it all as different game publishers within Take-Two, the larger publisher unit, and then also Ghost Story Games, even though they're a publisher of only one game, which is Judas. <laughs> but it's just like that level of hmm. creative freedom is apparently they're, they're on a rock star level within Take-Two, which is fascinating structurally if you're a dork for the industry. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, but check out that Friends Per Second podcast. It's very good. It's 
I think it's the best video game podcast rolling right now, if I'm being honest. I think they do a great job over there. Uh, Victor uh, Jesus Moreno writes in and says, what video game homework would you assign to the other guests on this panel? Personally, Victor assigns us to finish Dragon Quest V, Hand of the Heavenly Bride. Uh, Joke's on you, Victor. I was the victor of that game. I played that on DS and freaking love Dragon Quest V. Wow, teacher's pet. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, me and Victor are pretty cool in our Dragon Quest V thing. You know the hook for Dragon Quest V, Leo? No. It's freaking good. Uh, no, the, the hook, which was really cool, is you're like playing through the entire life of a character. You're kind of like jumping forward in time. You start as a kid, then middle age, and a little bit older. It's, you know, Final Fantasy 16 does it to a smaller degree, uh, but it was a very cool hook, and then you're collecting monsters and stuff. Is that I, the one the movie's based on? Yeah, remember that movie that we all had a vague vision of? Yeah, that one. I that, think about that movie a lot. It's like, weird, genuinely. right? Genuinely, that movie is wild. At the ending of it, where spoilers yeah. for the Dragon Quest V movie, where then they just reveal that it's all a kid playing Dragon Quest V. It's like a VR simulation. I'm trying to remember what it is exactly. Yeah, VR simulation, and the game's like breaking down. It is. It really surprised me. Like, yeah. It, genuinely if i think of like movie twists of the last decade like that's <laughs> up there of like i did not see this coming at all and don't get us started on the end of king's glaive anyways uh what do you guys think for <laughs> for homework I think you see the i think you see the main cast from 15 like driving off yeah they're like all right that's now it really starts <laughs> and then the credit song is born to be wild i think <laughs> uh, but what what game would you assign as homework I would assign you Kingdom Hearts, Ben. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You're not allowed to complain about Kingdom Hearts after remake and rebirth anymore. <laughs> I disagree. Uh, okay. <laughs> I would assign Leo, and if he played a little bit of it but didn't really get it, then he needs to go back to it. But uh, <laughs> Amplitude on PS4 from Harmonix. I think it's the best playing music game ever made. I think that game freaking rules, and no one played it, and it drives me insane because <laughs> it's so cool. Okay. Um, hey, 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 Jay, uh, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Leo, that was a slight nod, but is it, you dabbled in Amplitude? I'm trying to remember, what was your Amplitude history? I've never touched it, and I <gasps> don't know if I can picture it. Ooh, okay. That's good. That's a good first step before you try a game and have a thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> it rules. Okay, sorry, Jacob. Uh, oh, this game. I don't think... Uh, has, <laughs> have any of y'all played uh, the game Anatomy created by Kitty Horror Show? No, game. you said it was the scariest no. game ever made, right? I don't want to play yeah. that. It's, okay, ben doesn't have to play it. The other two, I think it's, I think it is like one of the finest pieces of horror ever made. Whoa. You know, like like books, movies, everything. It's like it is, it is exquisitely crafted to to a level that I just think it's like. I think if we all had this as a cultural touch point, we would like talk about it as much as like you know resident evil one or whatever like it is it is truly so masterfully made in, as as a piece of horror media and uh, i just i want more people to play it and what's it called again uh, it's called anatomy uh yeah. by by the creator kitty horror show when did it come when out I, when i google it uh itch itch.io link like comes up like a zap yeah uh, yeah it's not on okay. steam um, oh okay yeah it came out in 20 20- I don't know, 15, mm. maybe. Uh, so a, a little while ago. Oh, and I've, I've talked about it plenty and other people like it's not it's not an unknown game, but like right. it is an itchio game. Uh, it just means that a lot of people haven't played it. Yeah. Um, speaking of exquisite horror, I I don't dabble with horror stuff too often. But then every time I do, you know, like uh, The Shining has like, consumed my life over the last couple of years. I just can't stop thinking about it for whatever reason. But uh, like it's the real Dragon Quest movie. It is up there. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I just I watched uh, Talk to Me not too long ago, that horror movie. And I had that similar oh, was experience. Was that like the late night host? No, no, no. That's oh, the okay. more recent one. Talk this to me. Is, this is the one with like Ouija, right? Or like the hand. Yes, the hand oh, that you talk to the dead with. And I had that same experience, Jacob, of like after finishing, I was like, that is just a perfect piece of horror entertainment. Like I cannot imagine a better horror film than talk to me. It just completely blew me away. And it's like, maybe I am just being naive for not diving into this genre more. Cause whenever I do, I often absolutely love it. Uh, Leo, you look horrified. Are you looking at, are you talking to the dead right now and talk to me or what are you doing? <laughs> My internet's being bad. I'm waiting till it's fixed to chime in. Okay, good, good, good. I think it's maybe fixed. Yeah. Um, have you seen the talk to me creators, YouTube videos? No, but I I, sh- I watched um, the Corridor Crews uh, interview with them where they highlighted some of their stuff and it seemed really cool. 
Oh yeah, it's like Spider-Man versus Batman epic superhero fight. And they're throwing <laughs> right. each other through the walls, like, farting on each other and stuff. Right. Perfect. Perfect. And it, a lot of comedy directors turn into drama directors, and it makes drama seem easy. I think it's a little bit easier. Or easy. horror, you know? You got your barbarians with Zach Krager. Right. You got your, of course, your Jordan Peels, which I love. Blackberry. It's kind of a drama from a comedy person. Yeah. True. Yeah, we should try making a drama podcast sometime. It'd be really easy. Um, <laughs> Cedric Diggory writes in, and they say, Hey, Maxers. Harry Potter? Uh, that's right. Uh, hey, everybody. I've been playing a lot of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and about 50 hours into the game... I figured out that you can click the middle controller button while in the materia menu, and it brings up everyone's materia at once. From there, you can select and swap materia with the entire party on one screen instead of doing it for each individual character like I had been. I felt like a complete fool, but I was also relieved. Um, I'm 85 hours into Rebirth, and I did not know about this. Oh my god, really? Yeah. I, and I complained about how much materia swapping you had to do in that game, and I knew about that menu. Whoa. I beat it. I don't think I I knew you could do that. Oh my yeah. gosh, it says it. It says it on the menu. I, wait, does it say in a tutorial? Or is, like, I saw that this says, like, set no, there's all. No, it's, like, in the UI. It, it is in the UI. It just says, like, click, yeah. But I treated it like Mario 3 UI. I'm just ignoring it completely, I think. That's the yeah. way I've been playing through that game. That is... I, we, I, look, I think both of those games have major failures of UI. <laughs> We've talked about that game for like 16 hours in the deepest dive. Not a single person has brought that up yet. Oh my god. Uh, let's see. Uh, David Kunker says, no question, just wanted to note that Battlefield Bad Company and the demo for it for PS3 remains the undis- undisputed best demo of all time. Okay, I think that's fair. Uh, Bad Why? Company 2... There was a demo for that where I think it was just the Valdez map, and I really love that. That really sold me on that game in particular. So I'm going to say... Crackdown demo was really good. Crackdown demo, it like, yeah. It like sped up how quickly you would level up. Like in the main game, it would take you, you know, 20 hours to level up. In the demo, you would be leveled up by the end of the demo after, what, like 30 or 40 minutes or something mm, like that. You can nice. play yeah. the demo online co-op, too. I played that demo many times. Really? Whoa. The, uh, the Bellatro demo is yeah. like almost the whole game. Yeah, uh, they just don't have like quite as many jokers in there. Unicorn Overlord demo is like six hours long, and you can carry your progress forward. It's pretty bananas. We're at a good age of I demos. Had, I had a moment on the PlayStation Three. There was this game called Ragdoll Kung Fu, mm-hmm. which I never like bought or played, but I had the demo. And for whatever reason, the the UI for the PlayStation Three would always linger on the demo, and on PlayStation Three, it would like play music depending on what you were floating around, and that demo had like a great song and it was like stuck in my head the other day and I was like I wonder if that song's like online and I went and found the song and every comment was the exact same scenario as me of like I never actually played this game but I would let the demo screen linger on my home page (laughs) on my PlayStation 3 and it was just one of those moments where I was like man we're all human beings you know we're all together in this (laughs) (laughs) yes god PS3 demo music I did you ever play Super Stardust HD Kyle from your beloved Returnal studio Oh, I don't think I did. Okay. No. They had a great demo on PS3, and the music for Super Stardust HD is so good that I would play the demo again and again and again and again just for that music. It's unbelievable. Um, Aging Poorly writes in and says, oh, we're getting to uh, confessions if you all want some community confessions. Great. Yeah. Aging Poorly says, on my game log, we're ready to phrase it, uh, I've claimed to have beaten the NES Super Mario Brothers games, but I've never done so without warp, whif- warp whistles and secret pipes. Does that count? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, but with an asterisk. Absolutely, it's asterisk, built into the game. Asterisk, asterisk. You should no, play through. no asterisk. That counts, 100%. Oh, okay. Uh, Jason Wojnar I'm says... I'm adamant about this. Okay, I'm really all right. taking a stand on this. <laughs> uh, Jason says, My gaming confession is I only beat Final Fantasy VIII using all of the assists available to me in the remaster, which is like, yeah, invincibility and all that stuff, times three speed. You're doing fine. That's, that's well, it, no asterisk there. You're doing fine. Uh, Nicholas Cook, who says, please, Hanson, it's just Nicholas Cook. Pronounce it Cook. I'm begging of you. <laughs> Nicholas Cook writes in and says, weird confession, and I do think I really do like gaming in general, but <laughs> if I don't structure it like work with deadlines, thematically appropriate games for a specific time period, getting ready for sequels, keeping track of my homework and Excel sheets, etc., I don't think I would ever finish a game. Is this normal? Maybe not normal, but that's interesting that it needs to be so structured for you to get through a game. I think that's a fascinating perspective. 
Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, because I, I often it. will be unsure if I'm going to finish a game, and then I kind of go like, well, if I really like it, then I'll finish it. Right. That'll be no problem. But that often isn't the case. It'll like I'll take enough time off that I just feel done with it and don't feel like going back to it. I never end up beating it, and that's served me fine so far. We'll see. But where maybe it leads I would you. be so happier. Maybe more games. Super Cerberus writes in says, "My gaming confession: I don't like Outer Wilds." I was constantly lost while playing it, and whenever I felt like I was about to stumble upon some big discovery, I would run into another brick wall, or the time loop would reset, and have to start over and fly back to wherever I was. I gave it a solid five hours, but I never felt like I was making any progress. I got frustrated, and I gave up. But the way people talk about it makes me feel like I'm missing out. I get that, yeah. man. It's it's yeah. dangerous to bring this up around Jacob, but I, I ended up having, having to use a walkthrough to get that game, and, and ultimately made it kind of unsatisfying for me yeah oof that's rough uh john eric writes in and says uh i love playing red dead redemption 2 i've been playing it since it came out but i'm only in chapter six because i do too much bird watching and nature stuff <laughs> that's okay that's nice. you're winning yeah like that's <laughs> you're you get to keep playing red dead redemption 2 we're kind of <laughs> getting into uh sins of gaming sins here ari torben writes in and says one time i stepped on my friend's ps1 jewel cra- case and cracked the front of it the game inside was fine, though. When my friend asked me what happened, I said it was already like that. <laughs> Classic. Yeah, that's good. It just it just did that itself. Yeah. I was just watching it. It just crashed. <laughs> Felix Diaz writes in and says, Confession, I played most of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth in easy mode. Go Team Grant, he says. Um, well, that's unforgivable. Uh, Crater writes in and says, Dear cohorts, uh, I love Mega Man Legends, but I never made it more than two hours into Mega Man Legends 2, says Crater. Crater. You know, speaking of game lengths, yeah. Mega Man Legends, I, I played on N64. I rented it. Yeah. I I the end boss of that game, yes. I thought I had beaten the first world. And I was like, okay, time to go to the next world. <laughs> and I was like, no, you beat it. And I was like, oh. I had like no idea. I don't know why I assumed that game was so much bigger than it ultimately was. That's like it's, it's a strange. pretty long. It's probably 12 hours yeah. or something. Like it, it for some reason just the trajectory of that game i felt like i was going to like another world i don't know why like getting it, back it, on the really, ship the yeah. little flutter and going to another island yeah. uh, i mean the uh, final and boss holiday in the chat but, but points out that i played Mega Man 64 yeah don't be that's naive. not Mega Man legend it's a different game uh, the final boss is also very definitive it's like basically a jrpg god level yeah. boss you thought that wasn't no i was i was a dumb kid i really yeah. like looking back on it as uh, over the years i'm like why did i think that that was not the ending there was like no reason i should have yeah you're anyway. you're broken dude uh we so. got uh jai bones writes in and says isn't it fun when games have a really over the top no holds barred bombastic ending really devoting a big chunk of their budget on it but gamers don't see a game through the end. Is there a better way to devote this effort and budget in a game, or is it worth it for those few who do actually beat the game to have a big budget ending? Classic conundrum. You know, I, yeah. I wrote a video on exactly this a couple of years ago called Games That Save the Best for Last. Um, that that had that exactly, you know, it's like, it makes sense to have a big opening level because everyone's going to play that and it gets people to, like, buy the game and whatever. But yeah, it's like, Putting a giant thing. I always think of uh, the wonderful 101, which has like <laughs> sure. one of the most the bat s uh, endings I've ever seen. Uh, you know, and it's like it really, it it is really really worth finishing that game. But like that game is hard, and even the normal kind of gameplay of it is hard to get over. And so like I imagine that seventy percent of the people who started that game d- didn't finish it. But like, I think I think that it's kind of what gives games like a long tail. You know, it's like people keep talking about a game if it has like a crazy, really memorable ending. Yeah, I it, think it right. automatically gets mentioned in best moment of the year for sure. That's right. That's everyone something. in the industry pays attention to and references <laughs> constantly. Yeah. I think that's true of any media, though, is like the ending is the maybe the most important for how people remember the whole thing mm-hmm. if it mm-hmm. ends strong than the whole thing felt good and worthwhile. Yep, for I sure. I think it is worth putting that effort in. Uh, Jeff uh, writes in and says, hey, Ben, I'm writing in with a missed joke opportunity for the deepest dive. Oh, this is a slippery slope. Missed joke opportunities in shows <laughs> other than the Midmax show. But they said, when when you and the and the crew were talking about uh, chapters 9 through 11 in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, you're talking about the Gangaga region. You could have said, I've Gangaga for this game. 
Anyways, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, we blew it. We, I mean, we love saying the word Gangaga, but we should have we should have said that. You're right. Um, Elliot, wait, Austin Taylor writes in. Nothing to do with Elliot. Uh, and Austin Taylor says, I was over the moon with last week's Game Informer magazine subscription announcement and hey. immediately bought two years at an insanely generous price. Uh, while I agree. While browsing the cover art gallery, Kyle, please keep it down. While browsing the cover <laughs> art gallery, I was hit really hard with nostalgia over all the great covers that Game Informer has had over the years. If you have any fond memories of cover reveals back in the day like me, what were some of your favorite covers? I'm looking at the big Game Informer 25 years uh, the poster, thing, which yeah. I've got in my office and is yeah, very fun to just look at and kind of remember all those covers yeah my favorite covers for gaming former ever are the bully cover i love where it's just yeah. uh the kid and the oh, teacher glaring like at each, each other this is the most controversial game ever made yep yep it's how i know i'm legit but even even that one was a pretty clean cover for that era of game Informer. and it was kind of a, a messy era but that cover was awesome uh and then uh far cry 4 i love that cover art where it's just the elephant and then kind of the sand design uh the purplish blue sand sand design i thought that was such a unique take for for far cry force cover my my favorite cover is final fantasy 15 um really where it's just the the son and the dad like sitting on a couch sort of looking (laughs) at a giant um right uh, painting behind them i just like how sort of subtle and small it is you know it's like you think final fantasy you think like have some like showcase one of the big titans or something but i just like this moment of him sitting with his dad. I just, I don't know. I just really love it. And, and breath of the wild is like, I a favorite just for a million reasons. I mean, like uh, it's like a r- completely original art that Nintendo didn't really end up using much mm. anywhere else. I don't know if I ever saw it. I think they ended up using it somewhere else or, eventually. They, okay. I think so. If, if they did, it wasn't a lot, Yeah, which is always really cool. Um, yep. And I just love that art of link holding up the master sword and Zelda's on the back. Yeah. yeah. In the, the old- um, in the old office, they were um, there were big posters of the covers hung up everywhere, and it was kind of fun having like one at most people's desks, and people would like switch them out. Like, I want to have this one near me. Yeah, I, I don't um, remember too many of the specifics of who had what, but I remember Ben Reeves had the Warriors cover that had the little the genitalia hidden on it. Yeah, Rockstar put a penis on the stomach of the character on the Warriors on that poster. If you want to look up the Game Informer cover gallery, I assume that one's in there. Uh, it's a bit phallic, you guys. <laughs> the uh, the Bioshock Infinite one is mm. really good with yeah. Elizabeth and the Songbird. Um, the uh, actually these are these are right next to each other, but the Arkham City one, uh, which is like the very kind of black and white, and it's just like Batman and Catwoman mm-hmm. kind of together, which they, I, I think they used for the cover of one of the editions of that game it released so many times that it had like five different cover arts but do you remember yeah, the you remember the game really of the year thing. version of yeah. uh, of yeah, that, that game where it's just the text everywhere things on it. so obnoxious uh kyle what is austin talking about when they talk about this game informer magazine subscription announcement uh yeah game informer um we have <laughs> by the way, subscri- yeah, let me let me cut you off immediately keep it down kyle i do oh, like okay. kyle shifting into salesman mode goes yeah, <laughs> All right, sorry, uh, I mean it's yeah. I, this is like a we have it. We have like a, a Game Informer exclusive subscription. Now you can come directly to Game Informer to subscribe to the print magazine, which is I mean, we were thinking back on it and like during I then you were there in 2010, I was there in 2011, right? And then uh, Matt Miller has been there for like 20 years now. At this point, we were all talking about it. And I was like, I. In any, at least in any of our times, that has never been an option to just come right. to Game Informer and subscribe directly to the print magazine, which is why why it was such why it was such a big deal, and it's really exciting for us. And please check out subscription.gameinformer.com to consider subscribing to Game Informer magazine. <laughs> and and the wording is interesting because it's like it's a standalone way to subscribe, which means it's free yes. from GameStop's power up rewards. It's not that it's a completely separate thing from GameStop. Some people were like, oh, does this no, mean that like no. Game Informer split off from GameStop? It's like, no, no, no. It's just, no, no. It's a separate silo now under the larger GameStop umbrella. And, um, but, uh, yeah. Did you ever think about making it sub.gameinformer.com? I mean, it might be. It I don't know. Margaret over there, she grabbed all the URLs. Because you're saying subscription's <laughs> a tough word. It's longer than I'm used to typing. 
<laughs> I hear you. But subscription.gameformer.com and you can get uh, It's worth typing. Yeah. You can get one <laughs> year, one year for nineteen dollars and ninety one cents. And I saw a lot of people online going, How is that possibly financially uh possible like that? that's yeah i don't make those decisions i don't know i was just like i was happy to have the reference to the founding year of the magazine <laughs> yeah but yeah it's it's awesome i got a subscription for my nephews because uh, it'll be fun to have oh, that show you. up for them um so please prove that game informer is worth something and that uh gamestop should yeah, support them by going it there. is it is the most direct way to Say you like Game Informer. If you like Game Informer, if you don't like Game Informer, I'm not going to force you to do anything against your will. But uh, if you want a magazine sent to you, this is the way to do it. Yeah. And I think, you know what? It's been a while since I've had Game Informer show up in the mail. I don't know if I've ever, because I don't want to deal with that GameStop nonsense, honestly. But like, I like the idea of getting a magazine that I'm emotionally attached to show up yeah. uh, in the mail 10 times a year. And so this is such a, a clean way to do it. Uh, Crab Palace writes in and says, Hey, Leo. Uh, uh, I know you tried stand up and it wasn't for you based on the audience reaction. <laughs> no, he doesn't say that last part, but, um, <laughs> would you ever consider doing a live show of your own, something similar to your format of your videos? It would be amazing. Thanks. I would love to. I don't think I'm at the level where I could like expect people to come out for that. Hmm. But I would, I have thought about like securing 10 minutes at an open mic spot sometime and filming that and doing like a essay, video essay recording live mm. to what is probably tepid reactions. If I found the right like reason to do it, the right topic, that does sound fun to me. Would, uh, does the character in your videos, his, his name is Leo? Yeah. Do you like us referring to it as if it's you or as if it's a character? You can refer to it as if it's me. Okay, Leo, are your are your yourself. puppet alien friends? Would they be on the stage too? That'd be fun. Okay, really, you hadn't what? thought of that part. That seems like a big part, right? <laughs> no, because last time I thought about doing this was like years ago. It's mm. like on the idea document from from that long ago. Gotcha. But surely that would come up if I <laughs> brainstormed it now. Okay. So this is in that in that theoretical like you go and do ten minutes at an open mic. Like, would you want people there? that you know because i've heard stand-ups like say go in both directions like they don't want to perform for like friends and family and stuff like that like hmm. would you want that would you want to try to do it with like strangers or would you want some some people there that you know in the audience in this particular case i would want friends there who are more like ready to laugh than most open mic audiences i've seen uh because you know if you do a live version and then there's no last it's like why did i even do it live <laughs> unless that's part <laughs> of the, the point of it yeah and and in and this is we can stop workshopping this video but in the video then would you like dissect and analyze your time on stage or would it just be like here's a 10 minute video and it's just live and, and there it is i would be interested in doing something meta with it for right. sure okay or maybe some kind of audience interaction part some crowd work is <laughs> right my video's been missing i yeah. think i think you'd be surprised at how many people would come out i mean i'm not saying like do a tour but like <laughs> i did and i i know that our, our followings are of different sizes but like i did like a library talk last year and they were like way more people came out for this than like oh, cool. a, an author or whatever, which is sad, yeah. but also <laughs> like, I, I think well, that, you are an author now. That's that, there you go. Um, uh, but I, I think that if you, I think if you tweeted or whatever, like, Hey, in a week, I'm going to be doing this open mic. Yeah. I, I think there'd be a lot of Leo fans who showed up. I think for sure. And even, you know, min max yeah. community meetups have between like 30 and 40 yeah. people. We could we could rope those folks in if you want to do it at Minneapolis or something. So don't don't be shy on that front, Leo. Okay, yeah, get your so, puppets yeah. ready. Um, and then you can meet up type thing, but you're not allowed to speak to me. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Crab Palace says I'd also like to see how Jacob could adapt his videos for the stage. Yeah, I mean, I I did I did do this library talk once, which was basically just me kind of doing a, a live essay, and I had like a. Oh, I, I made a PowerPoint and then their AV equipment wasn't working. So I oh, did no. not I did not have an accompaniment. It was fine. Okay. Um, but so yeah, like I, you were like reading like you had an essay that you read, like it was like almost like a like a book reading kind of. I yeah, I mean, I basically memorized it. So I was able to uh, oh, wow. not just be I mean, it was also shorter. It was like 15 minutes long. Um, 
but but yeah, it was cool. And I've I've certainly thought. I mean, Blake and I have talked about like, could we do like a something rotten live mm. or whatever? Because I feel like that is a more natural. I, I would we wouldn't have to brainstorm what to do. Where if it was like just me like going on tour, I'd be like, well, am I just gonna like do an essay every night? Like I don't I don't know what that would be. <laughs> Here's an essay about this town. Boy, yeah, the I mean, traffic. Hey, maybe a maybe a book tour in, in my future. Oh yeah, that'd be, cool. yeah that'd, be, that'd be cool. Um and then Crack Palace says, heck, what would a min-max hour special look like? That would be kind of fun to map out, like to actually try and make it as entertaining as possible. Kind of like I guess it'd be close to like a PAX panel, but if we really tried to make it like a super fun variety show. I think that'd be a fun kind of puzzle to try and map out. Maybe that's just, we should just try and bring that level of attention and intensity to something like a PAX panel and try and just pack it full to be as cool as possible. Some classic new show plus concepts back for little mini sods and and snacks and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there's a way to do it. That'd be fun. But I have been thinking more and more, not to the point where I'd pull the trigger on it, but because the whole world of theater um, is so alien to me, but I've been warming up to it more and more later in life. And it's like, I do think it'd be kind of fun to put on, like, if Min Max produced a play uh, and, like, cast actors in it and just, like, put it on for something just bizarre. Um, and, Kyle, have I told you my pitch? No. All right. I haven't heard it's one of those things where, like, wh- why would I keep this to myself? It's pointless. But, um, so, well, I- so basically, you know how Alexander Hamilton was white? <laughs> Uh, no, but I think it'd be interesting. I am weirdly obsessed with the reveal of Borderlands 3. I think it was at a PAX panel, ironically, but it's just an hour long, maybe an hour and a half, and everything goes wrong in it. Oh and it's fascinating. And I think it'd be really fun to write and perform a play that's just the reveal of Borderlands 3 on the stage. Because you only need one set. It's just the stage that they use there. <laughs> And you can have a little, like, you know, the Steve Jobs uh, biopic uh, Aaron Sorkin wrote and stuff. You can have a little bit of that, of like a little bit behind the scenes of them, like, going out and trying to put this disastrous reveal of Borderlands 3. But, uh, Jacob, oh, I guess we should ask Haley. You could have given was... me, like, a year, and I never would have guessed that was your pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's like uh, the everything they do as part of the presentation is word for word exactly how it was. Yes. But then you kind of fill in the gaps of, like, how they got here, and you're flashing back. Right. Yeah. Yep. And, and also, it'd be really easy for actors, too, because there'd be teleprompters everywhere, just like there was, like, at the presentations. <laughs> you wouldn't have to memorize any of these lines, you know? Have you seen, I think it's called Peter Pan Gone Wrong. Have no. You seen, like clips of this. It's basically the pitch of the show, which looks really funny. I've, I've, I've looked into maybe like finding a version of it that we can like all my family can watch together. But it's like the idea is they put on Peter Pan, but everything goes wrong. So like Ooh. the set is built in in such ways where like things are collapsing all the time. Like there's like a scene <laughs> where the kids are in bunk beds together and they're like trying to do the scene, but then the bed like collapses stepbrother style, like on one of the kids. And like, it's it's all just like physical comedy. Um, That's a great idea. That is a really yeah, funny idea. You're a crook, funny. Captain Hook, the Arrested Development. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, kind of. I think it predates that, uh, actually. Um, I think it's been around That's for a while. Funny. But uh, I, I do it think sounds I, like similar to this, which is it's, it's, which is to say it's funny, and I think it's a good pitch, Ben. Thank you. I wrote a one act play with my friend Sam Snow, who I still work with in high school. That was going to be kind of similar. It was going to be really simple, like. Uh, they come out and do a little song, but then it keeps going wrong. And these characters who are like playing the director of the play will come out and yell at them and things like that. So, Leo, if I genuinely was like, will you come over on a Saturday and we can write the Borderlands 3 reveal play? You'd be interested in that? I. How would we put it on? We just get a stage. What do you mean? How do they do any theater productions? We could do it. <laughs> it's like more than a Saturday, though. Well, not like in one day, but just like start preparing for it if we were to do it and then like actually over on a saturday and i leave three months later (laughs) (laughs) we'll just like start working start brainstorming it are you that into the idea i that would be a blast could you legally do that like have a play that's called the reveal of borderlands (laughs) three yeah it's word for word what they did it's not libelous 
I don't think so. I mean, the stuff we did backstage well, would the, be, the, but... Backstage, Randy Pitchford showing magic tricks going wrong, <laughs> losing a USB drive. It might get a little lipolist. Yeah, the only hard part is we'd have to learn the magic tricks, or the actor would, who's playing Randy, to, that he yeah, performs the on the stage. Start, it is, yeah. Else would be a breeze. <laughs> get a magician. Anyways, uh, Beefcake writes in and says, when it was a kid... But seriously, if you're, like, going by a theater and they have a sign-up front that says, the play coming this Saturday... The reveal of Borderlands 3 when you'd be like, what the f everyone would go. Well, we would, yeah. Everyone, I don't know if everyone, everyone would go. Would. Anyways, Beefcake writes in, says, when I was a kid, the show Jackass was really big. So naturally we had to make our own Jackass videos. One we did was hooking tie-down straps to my underwear and trying to winch myself up to the second story window. It's a classic. Uh, I got about 15 feet in the air when my underwear snapped and I fell. Oh, God. <laughs> and Beefcake says, I somehow have three children now. Um, <laughs> anyway, what's some stupid stuff you did as a kid in the vein of Jackass? You know, I was, I, yeah, I was one of those kids for sure. Oh, like, yeah. I was, the disclaimer was for me. And I, I, like, there was one night where we, like, set a friend's feet on fire. And I, and I think back to that all the time and I'm horrified because the, like, having water nearby to put out his, his feet was an afterthought that at the last <laughs> second we were like oh we should we should have water or something and it could have gone so much worse than oh. it did like it gives me like anxiety to think yeah. back to that and i think there's i think on my youtube channel i think i have a video of it yeah oh oh my god uh, a memory that i have from like five years old which still kind of makes me shudder to think about is is one of those like weird it's weird to remember being a kid and having no inhibitions but once i was like sitting on the porch next to my father and i had the thought what would happen if i punched my dad in the crotch and then <laughs> and i did i just went like <laughs> and, and it's like that's a very it's it's not the jackass of like them hoisting themselves up by their underwear, but it is just like randomly slapping each other or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was just like, what what like monsters kids are where I just had that thought and didn't consider like maybe he won't like. This. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> it's excellent. really the jackass guys are just clearly such great friends that you're like, this is how friends behave. Yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. I, I made stunt videos with my friend Eric in fifth grade of just like jumping around the playground or whatever, edit them in iMovie. I asked him recently if they still exist and they don't, oh. which is too bad. What was the coolest thing you did? Was there anything that actually would impress us a little bit if we saw it? No. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Off a tall thing. Yeah, we made a video, but I was too cowardly to do any stunts and tricks myself. So I was like, all right, my friend Jesse, all right, he's super funny. Just do funny physical stuff and then we'll film it. And so it was just like, <laughs> I remember we... We had a bunch of tires at my house, and so he just, like, laid in the tires, um, you know, like, five tires or whatever, and then we, like, rolled that down the hill, and that just made us laugh harder than anything. We were, like, seeing something go, like, ah, 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 and they're, like, rolling around a bunch of tires going down the hill. And I remember one of the cool stunts was we found a snake, and then the snake was hissing at us, and he just kept getting his hand closer and closer to the snake so that it eventually oh would God. bite him. Um, good bits for everybody. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, I, in the in the jackass vein, I do have a memory of my cousin trying to light a fart on fire, uh, and it couldn't have been older than than eleven. And he had the lighter up, and I and when he passed gas, I saw the boxers like flap in the breeze of it, <laughs> and it was probably the hardest I laughed in my life up to that point. <laughs> Wait, and then the hardest you laugh in your po in your life after that point was the Ouija board fart thing. So it's only fart humor that's really getting you. <laughs> There's really something to it, guys. <laughs> Let's be real. Yep. Oh, you new show. And we were on a we were on a trip once, uh -oh. and and you and Cork were talking about fart humor. Yeah, and, I was and you don't like, like it. Like, and I was like, yeah, it doesn't do it for me. And then you guys pulled up some video that was just nothing but fart jokes. And I was like crying, laughing, like with it, like two minutes later, like I was just <laughs> when like, I thought highfalutin nonsense. You were like, you were like, oh yeah, let's test this theory. And I was like totally <laughs> eating my words. I was like, yeah, I, I am crying, laughing at this <laughs> fart video. It was the day we made you eat your farts. Um, None of us want to think they're funny. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What do y'all like for question of the week? Who wins the prize for my mate bit? Um, I like the live show. That's an interesting one. Yeah. I like the the yeah. uh, assigning homework. Uh, I like the unable to uh, distinguish from reality video game stuff. I mean, the live show is just yeah. like 
anything that reveals like deep Ben Hansen lore. <laughs> oh. Like, oh, I've been yeah. thinking about I... this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if the Borderlands 3 reveal play comes out of this now. We'll yes. feel silly if we give it to anything else. I, yep, you're right. I like that. Congratulations, yeah, Crab good. Palace. You won the stray vinyl soundtrack thanks to I'm 8 Bit. And of course, now it's time for something that we like to call Get a Load of This. <laughs> Hey y'all, get a load of this. Every once in a while you find a little pocket on YouTube that's just the most satisfying thing and it just feels refreshing and clean and pure. And recently um, I've been <laughs> just devouring a YouTube channel from Ian Attar and it's all about like my greatest needle threading in Spider-Man 2. And then it's like, there's a, there's a small scene that's just all about needle threading in the Spider-Man games of just like going as fast as you can and then just launching yourself and trying to get through really small spaces in Spider-Man, specifically Spider-Man 2, it is the most satisfying stuff to watch just to see them like go as fast as possible and then like just somehow navigate through this tiny space in a bridge or in a church. It's just super fun to watch. They're all like a minute long. You just get to see basically Spider-Man six stunts ultimately, I guess is the thrill here, everybody. Mm. Uh, so link below if you're interested in that. Uh, hey, get a load of this. I, I haven't watched the full podcast because I imagine they don't go any further than what this clip was on just TikTok. But it's um Bowen Yang from Saturday Night Live has a yeah. podcast. And he had Mandy Moore on as a guest. Oh, you can't call her and that. The clip that like came into my feed and I was like, I w I'm so glad to like they're talking about this is Bowen Yang is talking about Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> and he's like going crazy for Kingdom Hearts. And like this is like a guy who's like played a, a ton of Kingdom Hearts and he is talking to Mandy Moore about how she was his favorite Aerith. And he was like, no, you were the best Aerith. I'm so sad they recast you. They, the, the, the current actor in Rebirth, she's great, but she's no Mandy Moore. And like Mandy Moore is just sitting there kind of like, uh, thank you. Yeah, like almost like to a degree of like, who is, who is this? Was that, that was like two <laughs> hours of work I did, you know, a thousand years ago. That's but I just so love the idea of like Bo and Yang from SNL just being so effusive about Kingdom Hearts and the right. that Aerith performance. And it's just that that thing that I see occasionally that I always earmark of like, you know, you know, celebrities or something like that, where I'm like, oh, this this person like really they likes video games. You know, they're more than just like, oh yeah, I dabble with FIFA or Call of Duty. It's like this guy loves Kingdom Hearts to the point of like he knows who played which characters and who his favorite Aerith performer right. is. Like it's your favorite uh, so it's, just, it's just a fun clip to watch. It's like Robert Pattinson raving about Tifa and Aerith like that clip. Yeah, so, oh, this, yeah. Is, this is or a weird like, level of geekitude. Ben Schwartz had a Final Fantasy 6 joke on an episode of Comedy Bang Bang right. once that just went over everybody's head, but <laughs> it was just like, you know, I always love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, do you ever think about, this isn't mine, uh, but there's that thing when uh, Ben Schwartz was on Polygon with Patrick Gill, and they both did the thing where it's like, can you draw Sonic? And then Patrick Gill drew like a really good Sonic. <laughs> and it was like they both had like 30 seconds and he just holds it up and it's like a very good fan art of Sonic. And Ben Schwartz is like, what? You're good at this? <laughs> Those were fun videos. Yeah, that, that was great. Um, mine is actually, it's also about uh, Final Fantasy VII. Uh, it is a, a an article on Bullet Points Monthly, which is a very good um, uh, games writing outlet uh, by, by Pau Yumal that's talking about kind of their their experiences with like gender and transness like filtered through Final Fantasy 7 like oh. growing up with this and like what how those games position like Aerith and Tifa and kind of like the feminine and clouds inherent kind of like androgyny and whatever and it's okay. just like I I just read it and I was like oh this is this is good games writing you know like this is this is kind of like really thoughtful really internal but also very like canny about like understanding the different themes that final fantasy 7 is working with yeah. it's it's very very good oh. uh it does have spoilers for the end of final fantasy 7 rebirth so don't oh. read it if you haven't beat that interesting okay links below for all this stuff get a load of this creator i like uh internet shaquille who is uh primarily a cooking youtuber Love who him. He's awesome. He makes really short, no filler, straightforward videos that have really delicious, useful uh, cooking tips in it. My partner made the his chicken tinga recently, and it was 
uh, phenomenal. But he also has a second channel where he does more essay type stuff. And the specific video I want to shout out is called Why I Used to Hate Video Essays uh, off his channel, second channel, Extra Net Shaquille. Uh, I think it's a phenomenal look at the topic and always interesting to zoom out and like talk about the moment we're at in YouTube uh, culture, like what is dominating YouTube right now and the pros and cons of it. He's yeah. really good at just like, here's the point, here's everything around the point, and here's the real point I'm getting to while being like, uh, chill and likable and again no filler just breezes right through it uh, really great creator internet Shaquille and he's, love it. he's cool because I think his his real job or maybe what his real job used to be was like basically creating like instructional programming for like internal company use and so he was like a professional like educator he was kind of a professional video essayist for like like companies like construction companies i feel like was kind of part of it and so he has he has like a lot of experience with like here's what you actually do when you're making you're making something to teach people things and then like here here's how that differs from like what youtube videos do yeah totally that's really interesting uh, I, I first found him on vine when he was just doing comedy vines oh back wow with when vine was around uh, hey, get a little of this from the MinMax community. We have a whole channel dedicated to people sharing interesting tidbits from around the world. It's, it's always a great place to get caught up on the news or just find cool stuff. But Spencer P. from the community shared this uh, tweet um, and with some stats, and they just say, New York Times is now a gaming company with a news division. Um, and it's sharing the oh, stats so. about how for... Users going to New York Times, like more people are spending time there for the games uh, than reading the news for New York Times, thanks to Wordle and Spelling Bee and all the other stuff they have packed in there. So it's a, the rare case of, you know, a big company like New York Times making a pivot and they're successful with a gaming division. It's a wild thing. Surprising, but makes sense i see people streaming those games but really my partner plays them every day wow okay hey okay cool um but that is it for this episode of the min max show thank you so much for watching or listening to this thing uh just a reminder we do have the deepest dive if we haven't talked about rebirth enough on this episode um yeah we we're going on i think it's like around 16 hours so far and we're coming up on the grand finale of final fantasy 7 rebirth but um if you enjoy that discussion on our youtube channel uh, you can support it directly by unlocking the bonus podcast feed at the $5 tier on Patreon, and then you get all those deepest dives right in your favorite podcast app, right where you're listening to this, more than likely. Um, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but yeah, the deepest dive, it's my favorite deepest dive we've done, I think. I'm really, I'm really wow. loving that discussion for Rebirth so far. I think it's, I think it's really, really enjoying fun. enjoying it. Oh, thanks, Kyle. Um, so you can check that out. Also, in that podcast feed, we have Bonus Pod, uh, the Monday bonus podcast, the companion show to the MinMax show that Haley hosts and does an awesome job uh, on. And on this Monday's uh, episode, I was also on it, and we go behind the scenes on MinMax business stuff. If you're a dork for running a small media company like MinMax, uh, we get into how we're feeling, areas we want to go in the future, stuff like Trivia Tower, behind the scenes stuff. And so there's a lot of dorky, businessy media creation stuff on this episode of Bonus Pod. And also somebody from the community springs some Final Fantasy VII trivia on me, which is a fun time. But uh, we also have Spiciest Interview. This week, it's Kelsey Lewin. You can watch her in the hot seat with Leo Vader asking questions. Uh, and also shout out to everybody who's followed us on Twitch. We just hit 10,000 followers on Twitch. So thanks everybody for watching our stuff live over there. We greatly appreciate it. It's a great way to support us if you don't want to do the whole Patreon thing. Um, also, Haley and I tried to do Red Dead RP again last night, but we couldn't. So she watched me play Hitman again instead. And it's kind of like a new episode of Hitman's planning. So <laughs> if you want that, it's on the playlist tab in my channel. On Leo's channel, for sure. And if you want to know what we're talking about, we're talking about Leo's puppets. You can go to Leo's channel as well. And all will make sense, I believe. Uh, Jacob, you got something you want to plug, man? Uh, yeah, listen to the Something Rotten podcast. We're finishing up Disco Elysium. Our episode with Renata Price comes out today, who was, of course, on the Armored Core 6. Yeah, uh, nailed the it. Deepest Dive. Uh, she She's one of my favorite game talkers around, and uh, having her talk about Disco Elysium was a joy. So uh, listen to that. Sweet. And Kyle? Oh, yeah, just Game Informer subscriptions, which you already let me plug. Thank you. Hey, you're Subscribe welcome, to Game man. Informer. 
Uh, and thank you to everybody at the $50 tier, the Game Champion tier. You choose any game under the sun by locking in your name with that uh, tier. Uh, Procyon number six, Champion of Go to Tsushima. Uh, Joshua Ayers, the Champion of One Piece Pirate Warriors 4. Friend of yours, Kyle. Uh, Malcolm Holiday, Champion of Berserk Boy. Interesting choice. Great choices from everybody there. But that is it for this episode of the MinMax Show. We'll be back next week with a whole new one. Thanks so much, everybody. Be good. Have fun. Let's go. Let's go.